direct from Hancock Stadium at Illinois State University in Normal. It's the Illinois High School Association Class 4A Football Championship. It's the Panthers of Oswego. They are 12-1 against the Maple Leafs of Geneseo. They are undefeated at 13-0. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Stalker, working alongside Steve Mays. Our battle for the 4A title will be coming up in a few moments here in this game. Steve, you've got a tradition-laden program in Geneseo. They're back in the title game for the first time since 1990. Oswego is here for the first time, but we've got two communities that just uh, football has been the center of activity every Friday night this past fall. That's right. They're not real big communities. They're communities of about six, 7,000 people, but they love their football, and you can tell that tonight. I think all 6,000 of those people are here at this football game. We're in store for what should be a great game between a rather wide open offense of Oswego and the run oriented team of Geneseo. We'll set the stage for this game a little bit later, but now let's go down to the sidelines where our colleague Joe Passion has Dave Fry, the, ex the executive director of the Illinois High School Association. All right, thanks very much, Tom. And of course, David with me, and we buy our jackets at the same place. We just put different names on the buttons. Dave, uh, glad to have you out here. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the weather out here being so cold, but yet we keep getting great, great crowds. Why is it? The last three years, they seem to be getting bigger all the time. Joe, I think people love to watch their kids. Yeah. The weather doesn't deter it. When their kids are out doing exciting things, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles, friends and enemies all want to be there. David and I also talking about where other things begin with their parents and the leaders of their communities, sportsmanship. Uh, we're seeing it not only all over the program, we're seeing it all over the fields and the courts of high school sports. And in so many areas, at least I'm seeing a great deal of progress there. But we've also seen a number of examples, a soccer match up in Chicago recently, a football game also up in Chicagoland, one down here in central Illinois. Some things are still getting out of hand. What are what are being done to take care of those? Joe, I think that for one thing, we probably see a little more visibly the negative uh, examples because we're so conscious of sportsmanship today. Mm -hmm. But what I'm interested in is trying to make sure we emphasize the positive. The more we can show people the way we want them to behave, and the more we can provide good, solid leadership to that kind of behavior, the better off it's going to be. It's going to take time, it's going to take persistent, constant effort, but we're making some progress. Well, one thing that was very disappointing to me, and I think a lot of other people, we saw columns in the Chicagoland newspapers, at least, about how sportsmanship's getting out of hand, and particularly from some head coaches that were not taking the lead as they might. Well, there's no question but what coaches on the sidelines, officials on the fields, and administrators up in the press boxes and back in the offices have got to show the, the, the prominent, strong leadership. We, we uh, have a higher level of responsibility, I think, starting with myself, right on out through principals to athletic directors and coaches and officials. We set the atmosphere for the game, and the kids will follow our lead. So if we start with an intimidating approach, or any kind of a berating approach or a negative approach, we're gonna set an atmosphere that says, hey, this kind of behavior is what will get the job done. That's wrong, we've gotta stop it. We've got just a little over a minute here. I wanna ask you about the brackets. We've heard complaints and controversies over some of the brackets, particularly the 5A South bracket. And I don't think a lot of people realize the geographical reasons why teams are bracketed where they are, why nine and old teams meet nine and old teams, conference champions meet nine and conference champions, six and three teams meet six and three teams. Why is that? Well, there are some factors that over the years our football committee has wanted us to incorporate into the bracketing. Number one, you don't want a team to play somebody in the first round of the playoffs that it's already played in the season. Number two, you don't want teams from a conference to have to play each other again in the first round of the playoff. And when you avoid those two things, then immediately you throw some of the, the record factors and those sorts of things out uh, of the window and you can't adhere to them. If we, if we could uh, follow every possible factor that everybody thinks would be a good, strong factor in plugging in matchups, uh, it would be wonderful. But unfortunately, we can't with the number of teams we have into the bracket. So we go at it the best way we can, trying to make reasonable travel and avoid those two things that I mentioned a minute ago. And then we fall into having some other kinds of factors that people don't understand. Very quickly, David, what about the possibility of seeding as in the high school basketball tournament that started last year? Joe, it's always a possibility, but right now in football it would be very difficult in my estimation. Tell you what we are going to do. 
We're putting together a committee that's going to study the whole design and philosophy behind all IHSA tournaments. We'll be looking at classification, we'll be looking at seating, we'll be looking at all kinds of different matchup arrangements and different qualification systems. And we, as we do that, we'll both look backwards as to why things are done the way they are, are there reasons for them, or they, did they just happen that way? Ought they be continued that way, or are there great new ideas that have been thought of, or maybe some that nobody's even thought of yet that we ought to explore? Hopefully we'll come to our board with a report on that by the end of April, and we'll see what it brings for the future. Every year it seems to be getting better, and that's a big plus. Thank you so much, David. Well, you bet. Glad to be with you. David Fry, the Executive Secretary of the Illinois High School Association, and we will be back with a preview of this Class 4A championship game. Let's send it back upstairs to Tom and Steve. All right, Joe, thank you very much. Here in the 4A battle, you've got Oswego. They build a reputation this year, Steve, as being a wide-open ball club, 39 points a game. That's a lot of points. They have a very explosive offense led by Tim Salagi at quarterback. Rick Natividad is uh, one of their wide receivers that they really like to go to. They are going to have to have a lot of big plays against uh, Geneseo this, uh, this evening. But maybe an inspirational story for Oswego this year has been the play of running back Chad Bailey. Here's a kid that through four games into the season had over 700 yards and 14 touchdowns, suffered a debilitating knee injury, an injury that might end most players' seasons. Uh, we'll let our fans know he tore his anterior cruciate, and that is one of the worst ligaments you can tear uh, playing uh, football or any sport for that matter. He tore that and has come back in four weeks. That's unbelievable. Been a big inspiration to Oswego, that's for sure. But, of course, their defense might have been overlooked. They have uh, shut out five opponents this year. We, you know, obviously a lot of attention with their high-powered offense, but their defense has played well. They really have. Fans like to see that offense, but you hear the coaches talk defense, defense, defense all the time. Uh, the offenses do stick out, but we're going to see two very good defenses tonight. Geneseo is in the title game for the seventh time in their storied history. They were in this title game a couple of years in 1990. They thought they were a year away. And with the Geneseo offense, the fullback is king, and Jeremiah Shoemaker has not let them down this year. No, he hasn't, and the fans are going to see something that's very unique to high school football. They're going to see rotating quarterbacks. They will see two of them play tonight, and really the coach just tries to get a feel for who's having the better night. So keep an eye on the quarterback. Uh, it should be an exciting position tonight. Nate Durek will start. But when he was injured earlier this year, Josh Pierce came over from defense and took over at quarterback. And ever since then, they've had sort of a pleasant problem of having a quarterback controversy at Geneseo. But again, they are very much a run-oriented ball club as uh, Geneseo and Oswego set to go head-to-head -head here in the 4A title. Any one thing maybe that goes through your mind that might be the difference in this game? Well, for Oswego, I think they have to stay out of second and third and long situations against Geneseo's defense. They can't get into that uh, a defensive struggle with them. They have to hit with the quick plays. Uh, uh, we all know what Geneseo is going to do. They're going to try and drive the ball down uh, Oswego's throat. So they're going to keep it on the ground and uh, expect to see that tonight. We are about set for this 4A title game. Let's meet the two teams in this 4A championship. Let's go now to Stadium Public Address announcer Steve Adams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet the coaches and players for this Class 4A state championship game featuring the Panthers of Oswego High School and the Maple Leafs of Geneseo Darnell. First, introducing the starting defensive lineup for Oswego, let's meet the head coach, Carl Hoinkus. And now, here are the players at left end, number 44, Kurt Henriksen. At left tackle, number 56, Pat Smith. At right tackle, number 68, Andy Allen. At right end, number 21, Eric Jensen. At nose guard, number 55, Dustin Loberg. At linebacker, number 58, Brian Cooney. At linebacker, number 39, Josh Wilson. At cornerback, number 33, Ryan Ludwig. At cornerback, number 26, Craig Roscoe. At strong safety, number 42, Ryan Walsh. And at free safety, number 32, Dane Shaw. Those are the Panthers of Oswego High School. And now let's meet the starting offensive lineup for Geneseo Darnell. Here is the head coach of the Maple Leafs, Denny Dirichs. At left end, number 46, Ryan Shedden. 
At left tackle, number 76, Seth Graham. At left guard, number 64, Phil Smith. At center, number 68, Landon Newman. At right guard, number 56, Jared Sturdewagon. At right tackle, number 73, Kevin Wachtel. At right end, number 45, Matt Cook. At quarterback, number 10, Nate Durick. At halfback, number 42, Derek Wright. At flanker back, number 44, Eric Newton. And at fullback, number 34, Jeremiah Shoemaker. Those are the Maple Leafs of Geneseo Darnell. Two teams in the 4A battle, and to find out more about where these schools are located, let's go down to the sidelines and Joe Passion. Well, first off, these Panthers of Oswego out of the southwest part of Chicago, just north of Joliet and south of Aurora. They come from the Little Seven Conference, really with nine teams, and they had to get past some great teams just to get into the playoffs. Their only loss coming to Morris. Getting through the playoffs for the Panthers was a tough one for Coach Carl Hoinkis and his team. Getting by a very good Tinley Park in overtime to start it out. And there you see the two big shutouts. And of course then over four-time defending champion McNamara over the years. The Geneseo Maple Leafs of Darnell, a former four-time champion out of Western Illinois, just near the Iowa border. Nothing but tradition pours out of the green and gold. And Denny Durex and his team got here by defeating a great manual team. Then their defense put up a great battle against Rock Falls, knocked off Notre Dame of Peoria. And then the defense again coming through the big battle against Decatur Eisenhower to match up these two teams. Winds are very calm here at the beginning of this game, but temperatures are in the mid-20s. Back upstairs now for the play-by-play. Hi, -play. Right, Joe, thank you. And you can see there is an icy surface on the field. It may very well play into this game as Ross Draper's kick is taken and the play stopped. Uh, as uh, a penalty marker is down across the way on the uh, Geneseo side of the 50 yard line. And it's unusual to see a kickoff stopped in mid motion like that. We had a foul by the receiving team. Not enough men. They're supposed to have five men on the receiving line. They had four. So you see those. Conditions right now, temperature 24 degrees, wind, boy, just a balmy two miles an hour compared to what we've had of late. The last couple of years, you've seen those flags there starched out as far as they can go. But uh, again, hasn't been much sunshine throughout uh, central and northern Illinois uh, the last month or so. So this field, even though it's artificial surface, has not really been able to dry from the rains we've had. And, and you've got a rather slick surface out there, and footing will just be a little iffy until these teams maybe get a little used to it. So we'll kick it off again with the ball now teed up all the way up at the 45 yard line as Ross Draper you see in your scheme ready to kick it off again. Back deep Eric Newton and Josh Pierce and this kick sending Pierce to the four. Slowed down to the 20, and he battles his way, driving up to the 27-yard line. Dean Shaw making the stop for the Panthers of Oswego, a 23-yard return on the opening kickoff. Let's take a look at the Geneseo offense, quarterback by Nate Durick with Jeremiah Shoemaker, the key, the fullback of that Geneseo attack. Jason Van Acker, who moved into the tailback position in midseason, will start there. Eric Newton will be a flanker with Shedden and Cook the ends on the left and right side. There's the offensive line with decent size, especially on the tackles. Graham's at 220, Wachtel's at 255. So it's first and 10 for Geneseo from their 27. And with the call, it's Van Acker. And he is up to the 30-yard line, maybe the 31. Setting up the defense for Oswego, they run out of a 5-2 defense. The front line, you'll see, the ends are Henriksen and Jensen with Smith and Allen, the tackles. The nose guard, Dustin Loberg, Cooney and Wilson in the middle. In the secondary, Ludwig, Roscoe, 
Ryan Walsh, who has been a tough hitter defensively for them, but strong safety. And Dane Shaw plays at free safety. Second down. They had about five yards to go. Nate Durick, a quarterback of six foot junior. And they try to get him outside again, but nothing doing as Pat Smith, the defensive left tackle, is in there on the stop along with Brian Cooney as they bottle that play up for a gain of only a yard, bringing up third down. We're seeing the wing T right now out of Geneseo. They don't like to throw it much. I think they've only thrown about 60 times all year, so expect a lot of misdirection, a lot of motion out of Geneseo's offense tonight. But a big key for Geneseo is going to be establish that run with the fullback. They ran the ball 72 times uh, back in their storied history and a 4 AIHSA record back in 1987 against Peoria Woodruff. So they've had a long tradition of running the football at Geneseo. Third and short. Derrick's going to throw, and it's incomplete. Off the hands of Derek Wright at the 40-yard line, and it'll bring up fourth down. Ryan Walsh was covering on the play of the strong safety who flows to the ball well. A very smart player in the secondary for Oswego. That's a huge defensive series right there for Oswego. They're very leery of the fact that Geneseo can grind the ball out on him. And to get him three and out there is very important to start this game. Carl Hoinkus, veteran coach of Oswego, is dropping back in punt position for Geneseo is Matt Cook, and that's Craig Roscoe, the single safety back. Just about two minutes gone, first quarter, as Oswego's about to get the ball for the first time, and that one is shanked by Cook. It goes out of bounds, and Oswego will get it in great field position up close to the 50-yard line. When you've got two teams that are pretty evenly matched, though they do things a little different style, this is the kind of thing in terms of field position that can really make the difference. Exactly right, and especially as the, the conditions, weather conditions get worse as the night goes on. I expect it probably to be in the 20s as the night goes on, so field position is going to be a huge key in this game. They get the ball at the 46, and there you see quarterback Tim Salagi. They'll get the ball after a 21-yard punt by Cook. Salagi he has thrown for over 1,300 yards this year. He's completed 14 touchdowns through the air. Sets him down. They run out of a pro set this time, and getting hit right immediately was the fullback Scott Wolf, a 1,000-yard carrier, and he gets just a couple of yards. Let's take a look now at the Oswego offense with Salagi at quarterback, Wolf at fullback, and, of course, we talked about Chad Bailey. He'll be the starting tailback. TV down, he has got breakaway speed at one wide receiver. Ross Draper, a good possession receiver also, and Aaron Plaskus, who can catch the ball as well, are the receivers. There are the offensive linemen. Not bad side. Flares at 240, and Allen's at 255. Good size on the tackle, like Geneseo. Tailback gets a call. That's Chad Bailey, and he pops it out for about nine yards to the Geneseo 45-yard line. Oswego's really coming out and playing inspired football right now. We see a little counter right here, fake to the fullback, and he hands back to Chad Bailey. And look at Chad pick up some nice yards. So it'll be third and short for the Oswego team. Third and a yard coming up. Chad Bailey. Well, the doctor told him after he tore his ligament in his knee, he said, you might be back by the playoffs. He looked him straight in the eye and said, I'll be back before the season. Regular season is over. An inspirational story for Oswego. Third and short, getting the first down of some Scott Wolf as he is down to the 40-yard line before Randy Roth, the strong safety, brings him down. Roth, a short tackle, hits hard. There's a flag on the play right here. We get a look at what the preliminary call is here. And it's going to be a hold against Oswego. The officials for this 4A game there you see the referee Chuck Esposito with uh, Francis Gillo, the line judge, Bill Crop, the umpire, linesman Bill Richard Busher, and John Anderson, the back judge. Still third down. So instead of third and one, ball spotted all the way back at the Oswego 43-yard line, and it'll be third and 13. This is a situation that we were talking about at the beginning of the game where Dennis Durex didn't want to be in third and long. You don't like to be in that situation against a very good Geneseo defense. But again, Oswego's have the knack for being able to come through with the big play. Third and long. Play action fake by Salagi. And it's broken up. A heck of a diving effort by Randy Roth. The strong safety. The pass intended for the tight end Ross Draper, but not really a well-thrown pass for the first time tonight for Salagi. 
Tim Salagi is very lucky that ball went in the ground. Randy Roth really had a bead on it. And if that ball's up, he may have taken that the other way for six. So it'll be fourth down. And Ross Draper, who has averaged nearly 39 yards of punt this year, as long as this year was 54, lets one fly. It drives. Josh Pierce back, make that Newton. Eric Newton with a good run back up to the 35-yard line. So that's where Geneseo will send up shop after a 37-yard punt. And Newton with a 15-yard return, 8.08 to go in the first quarter. No score, the 4A championship game. Oswego, the Maple Leafs in the green. The Oswego Panthers are in the blue. Geneseo first and 10 at their own 35 as Nate Durick comes up. Now they will have a two quarterback system. They'll give Durick about two or three series and then they'll bring Josh Pierce. At least that's what the game plan is for Denny Derrick, as he told me earlier this week. And they'll see how one does versus the other and make the decision from there. Bouncing outside, the fullback Shoemaker. Second effort to out to the 42-yard line. He picks up seven. Dane Shaw makes the stop, the free safety, a 5'10 senior who's got great speed. And that time, though, Shoemaker, who's averaged over six yards a carry, picks up seven. Seven and a half minutes left to go in the first quarter. Tom Stalker, Steve May is with you. A lone wide out uh, is Derek Wright. More of a wing back on the right side. He goes in motion. Quick hitter up the middle to Shoemaker. All conference, all metro area selection this last season for the Maple Leafs. He stopped by cornerback Ryan Ludwig. They pick up a couple of yards to the 44, bringing up third and one. You see Shoemaker with 11 touchdowns this year, nearly 1,000 yards in the season. He's an excellent back, got nice speed, and Geneseo, like we were talking at the top of the show, really likes to develop that fullback in the game. It's very important in this wing T offense. They also would like to keep this offense with the ball. Get a good look right there at the secondary for Oswego. They're playing their strong safety in the middle of the field right there, really keying on the fullback. And they keyed on him that time and stopped him cold at the line of scrimmage. The first one to get him here, you see right there, Brian Cooney, their second leading tackler with 116 stops on the year. It will be, however, enough for the first down. They gave him the progress, and they gave him the first down. Look at the play again. That's how you stop the wing tee right there. Even though they were able to pick up the first down, you have to get penetration from your defensive line. Cooney called by his coach a fierce hitter, and you saw on that previous stop. First and 10 from the 45. Trying to get outside was... Eric Newton, the wing back, but he is corralled in there by the weak side cornerback, Craig Roscoe, who plays really good in man-to-man -man situations. I really like Geneseo's offensive game plan right here. Not trying a lot on the outside on the sidelines, trying to take everything up the middle. The field's a little sl slick. They're trying to establish that middle running game. But it's still second down and 10, as you see Newton's numbers for the season, averaging nearly seven yards a carry. Not bad for a wing back. He is, in fact, the fastest member of that Geneseo team. Second down and 10. On the option, balls on the turf, and falling on it was Newton. Back at the 36-yard line. Pat Smith was there defensively. As that time, Nate Durick was hit as he was pitching the football and put it on the turf. That's right, you'll see a stunt here, number 58, Brian Cooney on the blitz right there, forces the quarterback Nate Durick to pitch a little too early, and the ball got behind him. Luckily, Geneseo fell on that football. It's a loss of nine, third down, 19. Five minutes to go, first quarter, no score. Play action fake by Durick. Get some time rolling out, and it's intercepted at the 50-yard line. Intercepted by Dane Shaw. Shaw, who earlier in the playoffs had a 96-yard interception return for a touchdown against Tinley Park in the first round. It's the first takeaway of the game there for the Oswego defense, and the Panthers have it at the midfield strike. A big turnover right here for Oswego, and it's something that uh, Geneseo wanted to stay away from. You don't like to turn the football over to Oswego's offense. Very explosive. Back in one game, their defense got six takeaways in the playoffs and converted four of them into touchdowns. 
from the 50. Solani putting it up, looking down the sidelines, and overthrows his intended receiver down the sideline. And it was intended for Rick Natividad. He is the fastest receiver on that Oswego team, who in the second round against Geneva had 10 receptions for 110 yards. I expect them to go to him a couple times tonight. The kid qualified for the 100 meters last year. He can really run. And with a 19.4 average per reception, uh, that pretty much spells that out. They were trying to strike quickly after the turnover. They have it second and 10 from the 50. Bailey hits, and he is thrown back at the 45-yard line. The ball comes free, but his progress has been stopped. Jeremiah Shoemaker, who shows that defensively he can hit as well as play fullback on the other side of the football, was the first Maple Leaf to get him along with their linebacker, Ryan Shedden, their leading tackler. Suffice it to say, early in this game, it's been the defenses that have set the tempo. That's right. We talked a lot about the offenses here in our pregame, but uh, these are two very good defenses on both these squads. Tim Salagi, who's thrown for over 1,300 yards this year, and an equipment adjustment for Ryan Chen, the linebacker. Now they signal the ball ready for play. It's third and 12 from the Oswego 48. Salagi's putting it out. It's caught. Aaron Pulaskis. And he is taken down on the near side of the field at the 43-yard line. The defender, Eric Newton, stopping him on the play. It'll bring up fourth down, however. He did not get enough for the first down. They had to get the ball to the 40. With that little confidence builder for Salagi, good pass route run there by Pulaskis, who shows why he's a good possession receiver. Exactly right. They're establishing Rick or uh, Aaron Pulaskis and not just saying, hey, that uh, Rick Natavidad is the guy that we have to go to. They do have two receivers, and Pulaskis can show he catch the ball. It's fourth and three, and they're going to go for it. Fourth and three from the Geneseo 43. They got backs in an eye. It is the fullback, Wolf, and I don't think he got enough for the first down. It's going to be close. It was Drew Nash, the defensive end, who gets as much out of his ability as anybody in that team that made the stop, and Geneseo gets the ball over on downs. They stopped him a yard short. That's right. We'll see Scott Wolf go in there, and he's going to be held about a yard and a half short. That was a great stop by Geneseo's defense. So the defensive tempo of this game continues 258 to go first quarter no score the 4a championship game Geneseo and Oswego Geneseo now with the ball at its own 41. It goes inside to the fullback and on the carry that is Shoemaker who gets just a couple of yards. Let's go down to our sidelines now and Joe Passion. Geneseo quarterback Nate Durek telling me on the sideline moments ago fellas that it's not the turf that's so slick, but the ball has become very slick. The condensation on it makes the ball very frozen, and of course it's becoming harder and harder to throw. He just was unable to get a good grasp on it on that last pass he threw for an interception. He hopes to make up for it on this series of downs. Back upstairs. Second and ten. Could that be an advantage for a one-oriented team like Geneseo? I would think so. Here coming through the middle is Derek Wright, the wing back. It's uh, up to about the 44, but is driven back by a host of Panthers, including Andy Allen and Craig Roscoe, whose playing status was questionable before the game. Might have been a possibility that Shane Smart was going to get the start, but Roscoe said, up, oh, it's the title game. I'm going to play. They picked up three. It's third and seven coming up at the 45. Still no score. This game, for the most part, has been played in the middle of the field. It really has. Field position hasn't come much into play. And uh, with Geneseo not throwing the football much, they're just trying to grind out the clock right now. Single running back offense here, and they put a man in motion. That's Van Acker. Rolling out his Derek to that side, and the under throws Derek Wright. On a little out and a penalty marker was thrown late on the play, and we may have some pass interference. That's right. They're going to get Dane Shaw reaching in a little too early, tried to run right through the man. You cannot do that, and he's going to be called for pass interference. Us, Geneseo with a little play action pass right here, trying to hit the fullback out in the flat. And Dane Shaw right there for Oswego. Tried to go through him and got called. Now remember, the ball does not have to be catchable for pass interference to be called. Let's pick up the 
Call the penalty. Defensive pass interference. First down. Well, very plain and simple and straightforward, but again, unlike in the pros and in college, it doesn't have to, have to be catchable. And in fact, in that case, the defender was not playing the ball, was not looking at the ball, and that's why the penalty marker was thrown. It might have been a chippy foul, but it was but a foul on the ball. And that's the way they're going to call that on this level, that's for sure. First and ten, popping through is Jason Van Acker, and he gets good yardage down to about the 34-yard line. Ryan Walsh makes the stop, and maybe that penalty has sparked some life into this uh, Geneseo attack. I'll tell you, Jason Van Acker's a real horse in there. It goes about 6'2", 205. He's a nice complement to Jeremiah Shoemaker, who also is about 6'1", 190 pounds. So they have a couple of big running backs there in Geneseo's backfield. Second down and four from the 34 of Oswego. Getting outside is Van Acker, but they corral him down for a gain of maybe a yard as Josh Wilson, the linebacker, the six-foot senior, number 39, who makes the defensive calls. Well, why not? He has a 4.25 GPA. <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you right now, Oswego has two of the better linebackers that I've seen playing on the high school level. Number 58, Brian Cooney, and number 39, Josh Wilson, who we were just talking about. They really like to hit people. 17 seconds to go in the first quarter. Third down. Four yards to go from the Oswego 34 for the Maple Leafs of Geneseo. Up the middle and an apparent first down for Jeremiah Shoemaker. Dane Shaw makes the stop, but Shoemaker picks up a first down to keep this drive alive. A drive that was aided by that penalty as the first quarter comes to an end. Nobody's yet to make it on the scoreboard. A scoreless deadlock for the 4A title between Geneseo and Oswego coming exclusively on Sports Channel. Second quarter action for the 4A state championship. Tom Stalker, Steve May is with you. No score. But this drive, which was given new life on the third down play by the pass interference call, now finds Geneseo on the Oswego 27. Take a look at these two teams. They're scoring by quarters offensively, and they can roll up some numbers. Oswego, 39 points a game. Geneseo uh, averaging offensively, uh, they're averaging about uh, 26 points a game. And they've got it first and 10. On the counter, Jason Van Acker driving to about the 23-yard line, picks up four. Prior to that snap of the football, you don't think this hasn't been a defensive game? Total yards before that snap, Geneseo 23 yards, Oswego 18 after the first quarter. <laughs> that really is unbelievable. It's more unbelievable that the score of this game is 0-0. Both of these teams, Geneseo outscored their opponent 202 to 39 in the first half. And on the other hand, Oswego outscored their opponents 288 to 77 in the first half so unique having a 0-0 score second and seven Shoemaker had a little trouble getting out of the backfield and he is stopped at the 24 yard line by linebacker Josh Wilson no gain on the play third and seven coming up is there is Denny Derricks, whose son, by the way, was an outstanding linebacker two years ago on that 1990 team that lost to Joliet Catholic 21-20, one of the best games I have seen on any level of football in over 20-some years. And he took over for my old college teammate, Vic Boblet, who coached that 90 team. Vic now coaching at Rock Island. Third down and seven. Keeping it is Durek on the option. And he is inside the 20-yard line before he is corralled by Ryan Walsh, the strong safety and linebacker Brian Cooney. But a good job by the quarterback Durek shooting him as he kept it on the option. The coach of Denny, uh, Denny Derrick doesn't really like to see Nate uh, Durek run the ball that much. Here's a kid that had a lacerated kidney in about the seventh game. So they don't like to see him carry the football that much. They'd like to see him pitch it back to his running backs. It is fourth down, three yards ago, and Derrick says, let's go for it. This drive has had a little magic to keep itself going with that penalty marker. We'll see if the magic continues. I like this call. Here's a team averaging about 5.8 yards per carry of the football. Van Acker hit at the line, and he doesn't get the first down. Three Panthers get to him. It is Walsh along with Wilson. 
The first two to get there for Oswego. And they stop them and take the ball over on down. So the ball has gone over on downs twice already in this game. That's right. There's absolutely no chance of getting the first down right here. Look at the penetration on the defensive line. He didn't make the play, but he cleared enough room for his linebackers to make that play for him. Ryan Ludwig, number 33, also coming in to help make the stop. And Oswego takes it over. First and 10 at its own 20-yard line. 9.44 left to go, second quarter. No score. Quarterback Tim Salagi. Popping up the middle, that is Scott Wolf, the fullback. And he gets it up to the 25 yard line, picks up five. Jason Van Acker, the linebacker, who will probably be a Division I prospect next year as a senior, makes the stop. It's a very aggressive linebacker, goes about 6'2, 205, and really likes to hit people. I think we really need to keep an eye on Oswego's offense right now. There's a set right there on the last play. They came in with three wide receivers. They're trying to spread Geneseo out a little bit here. They would like to get a quick score if they can and try to make Geneseo play catch up football. Second and five. Bailey cannot break free. He can't break free from Jeremiah Shoemaker, who slowed him down and stopped him at the 25 yard line for no gain, bringing up third down. Boy, Shoemaker just had a hunk of jersey of Chad Bailey who could not break away. Shoemaker, the third leading tackler for Geneseo this year. They have a rather unique platoon defense system. They have two units of five that alternate on either side of the nose guard for Geneseo. Third and five. Salagi gets away. And it's intercepted. Intercepted by Derek Wright. He's still on his feet inside the 20. And he's out of bounds at the 10 yard line. A deflection and the interception by Wright. Scott Wolf brought him out of bounds. A 21 yard return on the interception. And Geneseo's defense has given their offense the ball in great position. You'll see right here, Derek Wright step in. The quarterback threw back against the field. You do not like to see your quarterback do that across the field. There are just too many bodies there. And Derek Wright picks this one off and with another block might have taken that one all the way. Gets down to about the 10. It will be first and goal from the 10. 8.09 left to go as right now goes over on offense. He'll go in at the wing back position. As they've got Shoemaker the fullback. Van Acker the tailback and Wright's also in the backfield. Full house backfield. This is Pierce, the other quarterback, keeping it. And the penalty marker is down. He lost the football at the one. And it's at the four-yard line. But again, the penalty marker is down. Josh Wilson picked up the football after it was stripped from quarterback Josh Pierce. They brought in their second quarterback, and Pierce, who can get outside, lost the ball as he was just about to get it into the end zone. But just as that happened, a penalty marker was thrown. And that far downfield. Looks like it's going to be Oswego's football. By the, by the offense before the fumble. The fumble was recovered by the defense. We have a first down. Boy, head coach Denny Durex of Geneseo elects to go with Josh Pierce. He's just a step faster than Nate Durek right here. He does get out in on the outside. It looks like he's going to go in for the touchdown. As you see a nice block out there, but he's stripped of the football, and Josh Wilson falls on it on about the three or four yard line. Boy, oh boy. Three turnovers already, and you see the quarterback, the other quarterback, Nate Durek. Of course, he was. Not in that ad series. They brought in their second quarterback as Pierce lost the football on first and ten from the four yard line. A couple of yards up the middle on the running play for Scott Wolf, the fullback, who against Sycamore had three touchdowns, 137 yards, and against Plainfield this year had three touchdowns on 141 yards. Right here, if you're Oswego, all you're trying to do is give yourself some room. You're backed up about the six or seven yard line. You just want to get some room. You do have a slight wind going at your back, so you are able to throw the football. But uh, I'm not sure Oswego will elect to do that. Second and seven from the six yard line. Just over seven minutes to go in the first half. Still no score. Here's Salagi throwing in an air mailing one over Rick Natividad. Only the second time he has thrown in his direction this evening. Natividad, the leading receiver for Oswego. Tim Salagi just 
Miscommunication on that one. Looked like he was maybe expecting to tip it out to go a different route. That's right. And that goes back to the point Joe Passion was making. I think that ball's a little slick down there. And Tim Salagi just overthrew that one. Carl Hunkus, his 12th year at Oswego, his first team there went 0-9, and, and he said, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but the last few years, they have been, without a doubt, one of the finest 4A teams. They have annually butt heads there with the Morris Redskins. They're in the little seven conference, which is not little in the way they play football. Third and seven from the seven. Salagi putting it up for the tip and odd. He makes the catch at the 30, and he's up to the 34-yard line. Newton on the coverage, but he threw that one for the tip and odd to run underneath it. That is a perfect throw right there by Tim Salagi. Rick Natividad definitely can get past his man right here, as you'll see Salagi just, this is a fade route, just on the outside, throw it up in the air, throw it beyond the defense, and let Natividad underrun it, and he did right there. Huge first down for Oswego. 27 yards on the passing play, and they do get it out from the shadow of the goalpost. It is first and 10. Natividad with 43 receptions on the air coming into this game. That is Oswego's first first down of this game. That's Scott Wolf. He's got the first down and then some. Boy, the ball slipped out of his hands as he went out of bounds. Josh Pierce was there defending on the play for Geneseo. But that ball does indeed appear to be very slick. That's right. We've seen it on the ground three or four times. We've seen the quarterback overthrow. Once again, we saw it pop out. But it doesn't matter. Oswego picks up another first down at the 48-yard line. Pick up a 14 yards on the play. Carl Hoykes, Oswego teams have gone 23 and 2 the last two years. Last year they were undefeated, losing in the semifinals to Lenox Providence, who went on to win the 4A title. First and 10, six and a half minutes ago, first half. Chad Bailey has a first down. He is inside the 40 and drives to the 34 yard line as he picks up about 18 yards. Josh Pierce finally making the stop. Suddenly the yards are coming in big chunks. That's right, Chad Bailey gets up a little limping from this when he makes a cut right there. Looks like he injures his left knee, but it's not until he picks up about 17 yards. Nice run by Chad Bailey. Boy, 27-yard pass play, an 18-yard run, now a 14-yard run. It's at the 35, first and 10. That's Wolf again, and he has another first down. That is four consecutive first downs on four plays. Eric Newton makes the stop. Now we're beginning to see the Oswego offense had rolled up 39 points a game. That's exactly right. And, and let's face it, that wasn't anything unique to an offense. That was just a basic dive play. Scott Wolf up the middle. He has 1,000 yards this year. Big fullback picks up nice first down. Six minutes to go in the first half. No score, but Oswego suddenly has caught fire. Back with more on Sports Channel after this. Four plays ago, Oswego had the ball, third and seven, back at its own seven. Now it's at the Geneseo 22-yard line. Six minutes ago in the first half. Getting the call, Dean Shaw, who has backed up Bailey at times this year. Shaw, a 5'9 senior, who's only averaged 9.4 yards a carry. That's right, not too bad to bring in a guy that's averaging 9.4 yards a carry from a guy who they just took out, Chad Bailey, was averaging 8.7, so it's a nice little average they have going. Their top four running backs are all averaging six and a half yards per carry on the year or more. Geneseo, I should say Oswego, has averaged over six yards per rush so far in this game. Second and eight from the 20. There is Shaw again to the 10. Touchdown, Panthers. Dane Shaw with his eighth touchdown of the year. You can see why he was a qualifier in the state track meet at 100 meters last May. A 20-yard touchdown run, and the Panthers of Oswego are on the scoreboard first with 5.23 to go in the first half. And now coming in is Ross Draper to add the point after. And Timmy Dan holds. Here's the kick. It is good. 5.23 to go in the first half. 
Oswego has taken a 7 0 lead in the 4A state championship battle coming your way on Sports Channel. So, an impressive drive by the Oswego Panthers. It caught lightning quickly. And the Panthers lead by seven with five and a half minutes or so left to go. You see, they went 96 yards in only eight plays. You know, they had a third and seven at the seven yard line. Never had another third down the rest of the way. That 27 yard reception by Natividad really seemed to be the spark. It really was. It gave them a lot of room there on the seven yard line. And then they just started picking up 10 yards at a crack. And look at the kick by Draper going all the way to the end zone, bouncing by Josh Pierce. And the pumped up Panthers will go on defense as you see running off the field there on the coverage team Aaron Pulaskis. They'll start on the 20 yard line the Maple Leafs of Geneseo will first and 10. And this is something the Maple Leafs didn't really want to do find themselves down early because when you have a ball control offense it's tough to come back sometimes. That's right. Uh, Oswego on the other hand they felt like we got to get on top of Geneseo early. Here they've scored a touchdown and an extra point in the late in this second quarter big plus for them first down back in a quarterback Josh Pierce he keeps it on the option and turns the corner to about the 23 Ryan Walsh the strong safety who is a bit of a free spirit himself makes the stop he's not afraid uh, Walsh is to wear short sleeve shirts when it's 20 some degrees out <laughs> there's a few of those guys out there you got to question uh, their intelligence I would think on a night like this It'll be second and seven from the 23. Josh Pierce, a six foot, 150 pound senior, was the starter at Free State. In fact, he was all conference this year as a defender. But when Durek had that lacerated kidney in the seventh game, he stepped over, took over at quarterback, and since then they've had a bit of a two quarterback controversy. But you can see why Pierce is still playing quarterback at times. He is just a maybe a little step quicker in getting outside as he gets it up to about the 30 yard line. We'll get a good look right here on what Oswego's trying to do defensively. They're doing a little stunning there. They want to take and get their linebackers to the football, but right now, Geneseo's doing a pretty decent job on the offensive line. Filling those tackle spots and forcing them outside, and that is one thing that Denny Derricks likes about his two quarterback system. If they're plugging up the middle, he says, I'll bring in Pierce, who can get the ball outside for him. They get the first down, first and 10 from the 30, 413 to go in the second quarter. Single setback, and they had a man in motion, and I believe they had some illegal motion as well as somebody got out of their three-point stance just before the snap. May have been the right tackle, Kevin Wachtel. As Chuck Esposito. Well, both start by the offense. Still first down. Makes the call. It'll be first and 15 back at the 25, and those are the little mistakes that can really help bog a drive down. That's right, especially an offense like Geneseo's that is ball control. They, like we said, they only threw it 60 times this year. They do not like to get first, second, third, and long situations. Under four minutes now for the first half on first and 15. They give it straight up the middle, not much. They did fake the wing back reverse after they quick handoff of the fullback, Jeremiah Shoemaker, but he got only... Uh, a yard to the 26, setting up second and 16. That defensive front for Oswego really doing a good job. Defensive coaches have them stunning all over the place right now. Right there, they just stunned it into the play. Jeremiah Shoemaker picked up no gain at all. Second down, 14 yards to go. Shoemaker and Van Acker in the backfield, keeping it as Pierce around the left side. But he can't turn the corner. He is swarmed over by a bunch of white-shirted Panthers at about the 25-26 yard line. Leading the charge was Craig Roscoe along with Ryan Walsh. Roscoe right now also plays backup at a running back, but with his knee a little bit questionable before the game, looks like they're keeping him on defense only. That's a good idea. They need him on uh, defense. Uh, interesting situation right here. Oswe or Geneseo brings in Josh Pierce, and they've been running the option on the outside all day when he's in there. Uh, I look for him to go back on the inside where they had success early. Let's see what they do on third and 14. Pierce sprints out, looking to throw. That is underthrown, and it is picked off by Dane Shaw, his second interception. And he returns to the 35-yard line. Pierce showing that he's a better runner than he is a passer as he throws his fifth interception of the year. Shaw with the interception, his second of the night. 
Josh Pierce here will see his receiver just a little bit late over the middle. And when you do that, you give the defensive backs too much time to recover. And Dane Shaw did right there and picks it off. And with a seven yard return, brings it back to about the 33 yard line. Third turnover for Geneseo, our fourth total of the game, just over two minutes for the first tap. As Salagi hands off to Wolf, and he is stopped. At the 32-yard line, a gain of only a yard. Seth Graham, Jeremiah Shoemaker. They're on the right side of the defensive line, combined to make the stop. Shoemaker, you see there, can really play through blocks and make the tackle. Penalty on the play. Will be holding against Oswego. That'll back him up another 10 yards. That stops the clock with two minutes and three seconds left to go in the first half. 7-0, Oswego with the lead. And with the turnover here in good field position. Holding by the offense, still first down. A chance for a big advantage here if they can put a score on the board just before halftime. It'll be first and 19 back at the 42-yard line. Fake the inside handoff, and it's incomplete for Wolf. Look like it hit off his shoulder pad. Randy Roth, the strong safety, covering for Geneseo. Scott Wolf right here, number 35, fakes the little uh, trap up the middle, then gets out in the flat, and he really has no chance to catch that football. That was a missile from Tim Salagi. Just hits him in the helmet, goes right into the turf. And on a cold night like that, that ball is even harder. It has no resiliency to it at all, and it's like catching a rock. Exactly right. Not that I caught that many through my rather unstored career. Second and 19 from the 42, I've been told. Big hole up the middle. That is Dane Shaw, who came up with the interception to start this drive. Randy Roth, Jason Van Acker combined on the tackle. He gets to the 35, picks up seven, and it'll be third and 12. Unfortunately, that play in the middle of the field will keep the clock running with about a minute 30 to play here in the second quarter. They need to get to the line of scrimmage, call another play, and speed this offense up a little bit. Oswego, if they had to, not afraid to try a field goal. They're one for four in that department this year. Third and 12. As Tim Salagi under center. He's in trouble. Get free. He fumbles the football back at the 42. And the battle is on. He got away from the first defender, but he got blindsided the second time. Randy, making Andy Allen may have come up with the fumble. And Oswego will keep the football. Geneseo's defense trying to give the Maple Leafs a chance to maybe get something here late in the first half as we've got a official's timeout on the field with 47 seconds to go in the first half. That was great pursuit right there by number 54, Rob Carruthers, for Geneseo to strip the ball from Tim Salagi. Unfortunately for Geneseo, they did not recover that fumble. But it's a time to punt for Oswego as Ross Draper kicks one right up the chute. Bounces at the 20, takes an Oswego roll to the 10-yard line and out of bounds. Well, it wasn't very pretty, but he got the right kind of bounce, and Draper is able to nail it inside the 10-yard line. And just 27 seconds remaining, a punt of 34 yards for Draper. I think we've seen quite a few of those today, Tom, where it's actually not a real good punt, but it takes a, a positive bounce, and uh, you end up getting a 34, 40-yard punt. So uh, very fortunate for us we go there. On a cold day like this, that ball's got to feel like you're kicking an anvil. Uh -huh. First and 10 at the 10. Let's see if Geneseo just... Runs down the clock with 27 seconds, down by seven, not wanting to make a mistake in their own end. No, Pierce back to throw. Sets up a screen, hauling it into Spiro Liris. And he is out of bounds at about the 20, close to the first down. Spiro Liris, the 5'10 junior, making his first catch. Linebacker Brian Cooney knocked him out of bounds. Liris, who's also a pretty good basketball player with some good speed. We have an injured player here on the sideline as we see the replay right here. Number 26, Craig Roscoe comes up and makes a real nice play with even a better hit there from number 58, Brian Cooney. And Craig Roscoe gets up a little slowly, but you see he is now being helped to the Oswego bench with 18 seconds to go in the second quarter. 
Seven nothing a tight battle. And for Oswego, an uncharacteristically low scoring affair. That's right, when you're averaging 39 points a game and you only have six or seven here in the first half, uh, you'd like to have a few more against a good team like Geneseo. Second and two. Pierce tucks it under his arm. That is up to the 32-yard line, getting 12 yards and a first down with only 10 seconds left to go. Ryan Walsh comes up from a strong safety position to make, uh, make the stop. Walsh made a big stop in overtime on the Tinley Park two-point try in the first round in overtime. A 21-20 thrilling win for us. We go over Tinley Park. Interesting call right here. Geneseo takes a timeout hmm. with about 10 seconds left in the first half. Well, you can't take it over into the second half, so go ahead and regroup. Maybe try one play. And lightning may strike. We've had enough clouds lately around here, too, I suppose. We were supposed <laughs> to see the sun today and never did. Maybe we'll see it tomorrow. We have two more games coming your way on Sports Channel, the 5A battle and then the battle for 6A. So two more champions will be crowned. This is our fourth title game today. As we've already the 3A game, we saw the coin win it. In the 1A game, it was Harden Calhoun over North Boone of Poplar Grove in our 2A game. It was Richmond Burton being Moequa Central A&M, 20 to 6. Danny Derricks looks on, his team down by seven. One, maybe two plays left with 10 seconds to go in the second quarter. A little razzle-dazzle with the reverse. Here's Matt Cook. And he is up to the 44 and gets the first down. Just two seconds remaining. And they have one timeout left. Ryan Ludwig, the cornerback, finally applies the brakes. And indeed, Geneseo will take its final timeout with two seconds to go here in the second quarter. 7-0 in favor of Oswego. That's a nice call right there by Geneseo. You know it's going to pick up some yards, but it's not going to be able to go the whole distance. Oswego's sitting back in a zone defense right now. They're going to let them take the 10, 11, 12-yard gains. They're just not trying to give them the big play. But on the other side of the coin, do you, do you show a play like that at this point in the game instead of maybe using it in a different situation? That's a great point. I don't think you do. I'm very surprised that they brought that one out of the playbook here with uh, about three or four seconds left. Left. Uh, very interesting call. Geneseo in its seventh title game. Geneseo winning state championships in 76, 77, and 78 in 3A, 82 in 4A. They were also second in 79, and again, that one point loss to Joliet Catholic in the 4A title game two years ago. Only one year since the playoffs began in 1974 as Geneseo missed the playoffs. 1984. That's An incredible. Amazing record. First and ten, final play. Pierce putting it up. It is intercepted. Dane Shaw, his third interception. He has a chance to go all the way. He is corralled down at the 27-yard line on the last play of the first half as Phil Smith, the left guard, came over to make the stop. But Shaw with a career first half, three interceptions, but a penalty marker is down. And it's going to be a penalty, an interference call, defensive pass interference against Oswego. And as we all know, the half cannot end altogether now on a penalty. Take a look for Josh Walsh at 39. Get a good look right there as the ball's in the air. He pushes him a little bit in the back, does Josh Wilson, number 39. You cannot do that. And that interception will come back. A little basketball pushing off long before the ball came out in that direction. Now the football will be on about the 41-yard line, and Geneseo can take a chance. Let's throw it into the end zone one time. You got a free play. So it'll be first down. One play left from the Oswego 40. Pierce going down deep. And it's another interception, this time Ryan Ludwig. Four interceptions thrown by Geneseo here in this first half. And that is the end of the first half. 7-0 Oswego leads. Low scoring first half, dominated through most of the first half by defense. One electrifying drive uh, to get the touchdown for the Oswego Panthers as they Shoot up a lot of yards in a hurry. I really like this Oswego team. Very 
diverse on offense. They can run the ball. They can show they can throw it a little bit. Geneseo is going to have to go back in at halftime and find a, a different game plan. They're going to have to come out and throw it a little bit. Oswego's not even respecting the pass from Geneseo. Down on the sidelines, Oswego's coach Carl Hoinks with our Joe Passion. All right, thanks very much, fellas. And I'm sure you'd like to have a couple more Shaws out there and just keep intercepting the ball the way things are going. Yeah, they're just throwing it up, and he's doing a great job of roaming back there. So, uh, you know, it's really nice. I thought we should have another score, but we got to get another score on the board because they're a good football team. So we'll see what happens in the second half. You know, so much talk about the two great offenses coming into this game, but we're seeing two great defenses out here. Is there a particular reason why you can pinpoint that? Well, you know, both teams have had good defenses on the year, and uh, you have good athletes on defense. We have good athletes on ours. They got them on there. They're flowing to the ball. We're flowing to the ball, and there's some great hitting going on out there. So, you know, I don't know if the offense has caught up yet with the defense. So we'll see what the second half brings. One last quick thing. Major focus on your halftime discussions here right now. What adjustments you feel right now you want to make? One thing, we got to stop the penalties. We've had about three or four penalties that have hurt us. And uh, I think we can move the football. Uh, we got to find a way to block the one defensive end. He's killing us on pass protection. But after that, you know, I think we can run our offense. All right, Coach. Have a great second half. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the we go Panthers leading here at the break, seven to nothing, and we will be back with more of our halftime festivities and the scoring summary right after this timeout. Welcome back, Tom Stalker, Steve Mays with you as at halftime of the 4A title game, it's the Oswego Panthers leading 7-0. Five turnovers in the first half, but none have been able to be turned into touchdowns. The one uh, only touchdown capping off a 96-yard drive for the Oswego Panthers as Shaw took it in from 20 yards. And it's been really the Shaw show for the first half. He's also had, uh, what, three interceptions exactly in the ballgame. Exactly right. And that 20-yard run plus the kick by Draper. Key to drive that seemed to be stalled at one point deep in uh, Oswego's end, but a big 27-yard catch by Natividad got that drive going in a hurry. So they lead 7-0. Yeah, Oswego hasn't really thrown it as much as we thought they would. Maybe that ball is slick like Joe Passion said, but uh, the pass play to uh, Natividad was a huge one there in the first half to keep that drive going to get him seven-point lead. So at halftime here at Hancock Stadium at Illinois State University, it's at uh, halftime of the 4A title game. Joe Passion will be coming up in a little bit to talk with Don Robinson of the IHSA office. That and lots more coming up as this coverage continues on Sports Channel. And here on the field at the break with the Geneseo marching band entertaining the live crowd here at Hancock Stadium. It's Oswego on top at the half, seven to nothing. Joe Passion back here with you at Hancock Stadium on the campus of Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois. And with me is Don Robinson, the longtime associate director of the Illinois High School Association. And also one of his many, many duties is that to choose the officials for these games each year. And, and I know these guys come in with the same feeling of pride and honor as the players and coaches themselves because they earn a shot here. Well, that's true, Joe. They worked a lot longer, really, than the kids had to get here. Some of these guys have been around. 25 or 30 years before they ever get the chance to work here but they're rated highly by the schools who they work for all year long and uh, as they work from one round to two rounds and uh, up through the semifinals and finally get the opportunity to work down here three or four times it's a great honor for them. The interesting thing I find Don when I talk to these guys is they're making it more of a social weekend than anything else whether they work the games this morning they still stay for the, the whole weekend and it's almost like you guys have a little fraternity here every week every uh, year whether it's football, basketball, or baseball for these guys? Well, I think with football people particularly, uh, we bring them down here in crews, and uh, as you know, there are five of them, and they've been working together all year long, and, and most of them, at least three or four of them, have been working together for uh, uh, a, a lot of years, and uh, one crew that, that, that comes to mind will be back down here in a couple of years. You know, they have like 135 or 40 years all totaled together in officiating, so, uh, you know, they, they really work hard at it. They really do, and... and while the kids aren't perfect, neither are the officials, and the tournament isn't perfect. So, uh, uh, you know, they're just a great bunch of people, and I enjoy having them come down and have a good time. What's the most difficult thing for you in choosing the officials and, and how you gauge how well they do? Because 
unless someone really stands out as being poor, most of the officials do a great job. Well, I look for hustle, mostly. I look for rules knowledge, more in basketball rules knowledge than I do in football, because there's five of them in football, and and uh, you see a football officials huddle sometimes and, and make a decision from there, and, and that's the way it should be. I, the, the basic rule for officiating is get it right. And, and most of the time they do, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's so many people who deserve to be down here. I can only bring six crews at one time down. And uh, uh, if uh, the good people out there will be patient, hopefully they'll all get their chance. Had there been any particular rules this year, Don, or any rules that are coming up for uh, the controversial side of rules, things that maybe the high school, uh, the IHSA is rethinking about either uh, moving the rule around or advancing a rule? Well, uh, Joe, we follow the National Federation rules, so the rules that we apply to football in, at high school football in the state of Illinois are, are rules that are applied across the United States with the exception of a couple of three states. So this year, I think the main changes were some things that we allowed the snapper to do in the past that uh, we have not, did not allow them to do this year. They used to come up, put their hands on the ball, adjust it, take their hands off the ball. You had a problem calling encroachment. Uh, but by and large, that was the big change this year. I think we're all upset a little bit about uh, pass interference. Uh, the colleges really, I think, have a better rule than we do. Uh, they have the uncatchable pass rule. We can have pass interference in high school football on the side of the field where the football isn't thrown. So, uh, you know, it, and, and most officials really cringe when they have to call that, and, and I get on them. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a rule in high school football, so you have to do it. There's some good things about it, but I, I think the colleges have a better rule, and, and that's very controversial. What you do with penalties on kicks is also controversial, so we got a lot of work to do in that area. Well, I'll tell you what, you may have a lot of work to do in a lot of areas, Don, and it'll never be perfect, but you guys are as close to it as possible. You do a great job. These crews do a tremendous job, and they never, never get enough exposure. Thanks very much, Joe, and I, I'm sure those officials out there watching us will appreciate a media guy saying that once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Don, have a great weekend. We appreciate you having us. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. All right, Don Robinson of the Illinois High School Association here at the break at Hancock Stadium. Geneseo's in the locker room, but they trail 7 0 to Oswego. We will be back with more right after this timeout. Tom Stocker and Steve Mays with you as we're getting ready for the second half of this 4A title game right now. A tight battle with Oswego leading Geneseo by seven, the only touchdown in the game. This is Shaw on a nice 20 yard run, capping off a 96 yard drive. Little scamper right here by Dane Shaw. Toss sweep, and he shows his speed. Very versatile running back, very athletic, and he just gets outside of all the Geneseo defenders and outruns them to the goal line to give them a six to nothing lead. And they did make that uh, extra point to go up seven zip. Watch it from the end zone. Watch the block by the fullback, Wolf, 35. Kind of an unsung hero in the offensive scheme for uh, Oswego, but he did a nice block right there to get Wolf, uh, Shaw into the end zone. Also the left guard, Charles Hubbard, with a nice block to help get him outside on the play. As at halftime, it's uh, Oswego leading in total offense, 118 to 83. And you see an edge in passing yards for Oswego. Turnovers, big edge for Geneseo, but again, neither one, none of the turnovers have been turned into scores so far. That's right, but I think if you go and talk to the Geneseo coaches, you don't like to be leading in that category, that's for sure. But Geneseo has had the ball nearly five minutes more in the first half than Oswego. But that doesn't really matter that much to Oswego, the way they can move the ball quickly. That's right. We knew coming into this football game that Geneseo would probably lead in that category. Oswego has that high-powered offense, like to hit on you quickly, and they have here once, and they lead 7 to nothing. All right, we're we'll back with the third quarter of our 4A title game, and we'll also hear from the Geneseo coach, Denny Dirks after we take this timeout. All this coming your way on Sports Channel. We are back moments away from the start of the third quarter. Don't forget all this coverage continues tomorrow with the 5A game starting at 12 noon. It's Wheaton Warrenville South against Joliet Catholic. We knocked off Mont Carmel to get to the finals. And at 2.30, it's the 6A battle between Loyola Academy and Naperville North. Loyola Academy out of the Catholic lead. Naperville North out of that very tough DuPage Valley Conference. It'll be a heck of a battle. And again, it all starts at 12 noon tomorrow on Sports Channel. We still have a half a football left in this 4A battle, and 
a first half dominated by defense. And to talk about the second half, let's get a few words from the Geneseo head coach who joins Joe Passion down on the sidelines. Dennis, real quickly about your adjustments being made at halftime here for the second half. Oh, just fine. We know we're right in the ball game. We got to find a way to get a few things going offensively, and then we got to get playing in the second half. Quarterback, which way are you going to go there? Well, we'll let you guys figure that out. Okay, coach, thank you very much. Seems like he is ready to put the pads on and play himself. We'll send it back upstairs, guys. Uh, Denny figures with the high paid bucks we get, we, we won't be able to figure that out pretty soon. But that's, he said in the, in the press conference during the week, and they asked him about which quarterback he's going to use. He says, hey, I want my opponent to, to do some work on scouting films and breaking things down. I don't want to give it to him easily. And that's just the way. I, I have an idea, though. But I think you're going to see more of Pierce. I agree with that. He's probably a better passer. But, uh, you know, let's don't uh, forget that they like the two-quarterback system. And uh, we'll probably see a little bit of both of them in the second half, I would think. Do you think somebody's going to be able to break it open in the second half? Or do you see the defenses continue to dominate here in the second half? Well, I think the defenses are going to continue to dominate. I think Geneseo's got to step it up a notch on offense, like Coach Durak said right there. They've got to find a way to start picking up some yardage. Uh, if that means throwing the football a little more, something they don't like to do, they're going to have to do that. Geneseo here in 1990 in the 4A title game at 21-20 loss. They came back with a touchdown to cut it to 21-20. And instead of going for overtime, kicking the extra point, Vic Boblet said, we're going to go for two and go for the win. And I'll never forget the running back. I cannot remember his name, but getting stopped by, by John Horn, the great lineman for Joliet Catholic at about the one-yard line. It was a heart-rendering moment. It was uh, still one of the best games I've covered in 20-plus years. And uh, 4A continues. Uh, I remember the Morris-Richards uh, game of a couple of years ago. 4A continues to provide just some great, great action. It really does. And uh, getting back to Geneseo a little bit, it's only 7 to nothing. It's no time to uh, panic right here. Stay with your game plan. You like to run the football. Continue to do so. But I think they need to mix it up like we've mentioned a couple times. But you can see why Carl Hoinkus would like to have had that maybe that second touchdown there late in the first half because Geneseo being a ball control team, a team that you'd like to make them play from behind, but one score down, obviously Geneseo very much in this football game with one half left to go. It is seven to nothing in favor of, as you can read on the back of Coach Hoinkus there, the Oswego Panthers. Last year, Oswego twice beating Morris, their arch rival. This year, Morris whomped them. Scored two touchdowns the first 36 seconds. Hoinka <laughs> says Morris would have beaten anybody, the 49ers, anybody that night. They were ready to play. I'll tell you, that's a program that's really taken off, hasn't it, Morris? I think they were ranked in the country last year and were upset, but uh, they came back this year with another very good football team. The, the little seven conference was just taking a little page from the Big Ten and not really been truthful with the name. They have obviously nine members in the little seven. They play some outstanding football out there in that at the Fox Valley corner out there out to uh, US 34 and uh, first Geneseo from the NCIC they don't get a lot of publicity obviously in the Chicago area they usually come into this game as sort of the unknown but uh, as Denny Derricks told me he said hey don't sell the NCIC short when you're playing the streeters and, and others in fact he considers Oswego to be very much in the same style of an NCIC conference team that's right. There's a lot of good football teams up north where Geneseo's at as well. Sterling and, you know, Spring Valley, all those teams up there. They can play football as well. And uh, here with the second half, getting ready to start, we'll find out that Geneseo can play some football. Oswego will get the ball to begin the third quarter as Spiro Laris is in to kick off with Roscoe and Shaw back deep. Let's see, Natividad is back deep instead of Roscoe. There's a knuckleballing kick to an up man and falling on it at the 43-yard line was for uh, Oswego. Let's see. That's going to be linebacker Josh Wilson. Despite the gloves, did a good job holding on to that bouncing football. And they get it in good field position at the 44. They put it on the side like that. <laughs> good look right there. Good camera shot of how the football was placed on the tee. Kind of a squib kip. But one thing, it gives Oswego excellent field position to start the second half. Bit of a gamble by Geneseo to begin the third quarter. As quarterback Tim Salagi has him in an eye formation and two wide outs to the left side. Oh, Bailey goes down hard and a penalty marker goes down late as Bailey was submarined by defensive end Drew Nash. Not blessed with a world of a talent, but 
works hard and makes good use of what ability he does have. It's nice to see Chad Bailey come back here early in the second. He went out there at the end of the first half, a little limping on his left knee, and nice to see him back here in the second half. Of course, if you just joined us, Bailey tearing completely his anterior cruciate ligament in his knee and was back playing football, though not, not 100%, obviously, but was back in, in four weeks. Lepping by the defense, still first down. Of course, many years ago, if you just tore cartilage, you might have ended your career. Now the marvels of medicine the way that technology has improved in that field, uh, they can have you back in three or four weeks, as uh, he's proven today. So it'll be first down and 25 all the way back at the 29-yard line for the Panthers. Natibi Dad, check that. That is Salagi. He may be looking for Natibi Dad. Throws it off short. A penalty marker is down. He finds Aaron Pulaskis, who has stopped at the 32-yard line for a gain of only three. Rob Carruthers, defensive tackle makes the stop but another holding call we heard coach Carl Hunkis talk penalty flag on the play at the end of the first half about we've got to quit these stupid penalties and that hasn't happened yet no they come out here in the first series and commit two and really put themselves in a bind this is going to be first down again and a long way to go any more penalties and they'll be uh, putting the ball in play from back in Oswego Sixth penalty of the game for Oswego, and they've been penalized for 75 yards. This will be first down and 35. Holding. Offense. First down. Not only does that stop any momentum you might ha have had on offense going in here the second half, but that backs you up to the 10-yard line. Now you're thinking field position. Let's just get out of here where we can punt the football and get this thing away from our goal line. Take a look. They're back now at the 19. They've got to go 35 yards all the way up. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. About 44 yard line. First down. They're going to run the football. Wolf. He's up over the 25. And to the 30 yard line. Picks up 11 yards. Jeremiah Shoemaker with the stop. But boy, firing out of there. Derek Rob trying to fire up a fumble. Look like. And Geneseo has picked it up. It came right at the end of the play. Geneseo has gotten the turnover, and they'll take it over at the 30-yard line. Very surprised right here at the end. You'll see Scott Wolf drop the football, and that did come out before his knee was on the ground, and we really didn't get a chance to see who picked that one up. It looked like it might have been number 54, Rob Carruthers or Shoemaker, number 34. It's at the 30. That's Van Acker to about the 28-yard line. He picks up two. Ten minutes, ten seconds to go in the third quarter. And let's see if for the first time tonight one of these two teams will cash in on a turnover. That is the sixth turnover of this game. That's why you can never count Geneseo out. They play that good hard-nosed defense, like to get those turnovers. They pick one up right here. Hey, they're on the 28-yard line going in for a score. Second down from the 28. The fullback gets the call, and he gets maybe a yard as it was Shoemaker running right into nose guard Dustin Loberg, the six foot, 210 pound senior. Tough, strong, very, very physical. And very agile for a nose man. He likes to move around there on the center and provides an excellent play for Oswego on that one. It'll be third and two. They'll go with the full house backfield with Shoemaker. And Van Acker. And either Ryder Newton. That was. So the pass is complete. Near side. Pierce's pass. It's complete at the 22 yard line. And making the catch. That was Jason Van Acker coming out of the backfield. Let's take a look at it from the end. Very surprised. Geneseo goes to the uh, play action pass right here. And it's really a nice throw by Josh Pierce on the outside. Not enough for the first down. It'll be fourth and about three. We're seeing a lot of wishbone out of Geneseo tonight. I thought basically they were a wing T offense. We've seen a lot of wishbone from them tonight. It'll be fourth down from the 23. Van Acker looks to have the first down at about the 19 yard line. They had to get it to the 20, and yes, he does have the first down. Or was that? 
That was carrying the football Derek Wright, not Van Ecker. 42, not 47. Dane Shaw makes the stop, but it is a Geneseo first down as Derek Wright trying to pump up the Geneseo fans on the near side here of Hancock Stadium. Derek Wright plays that wing back position. He's proven he can carry the football a little bit. Picks up a nice game to keep the drive going for Geneseo. Again, the full house backfield with Shoemaker, Van Acker, and Newton. Pierce keeping. He is knocked off his feet at the 20-yard line by the strong safety, Ryan Walsh. Walsh, who had an interception against Wakanda in the quarterfinals, along with six tackles in that game. I'll tell you, they list him as a strong safety, but he plays more like a linebacker. He makes a lot of tackles flowing to the football. It'll be second down, 11 yards to go. Geneseo getting a fumble recovery at the Oswego 30. They're now at the 19. 8.16 to go in the third quarter. Pierce rolling out and throwing it beyond Eric Newton's reach. Trying to throw it out there in the right flat. Dane Shaw providing coverage out of the secondary for Oswego. It'll bring up third and 11. Really a smart throw right here by Josh Pierce. I don't think he had an open receiver. Well, well actually, you know, that was pretty good coverage, but uh, they weren't going to pick up much of a gain. I mean, we got second 11 yards. I think they need to throw it down the football field a little more than just out in the flat. They need to try something over the middle or into the end zone. At the 19, third and 11. Pierce throwing back against the flow. It's a touchdown. Touchdown, Ryan Shedden. First time he has touched the football on offense, and Shedden takes it in from 19 yards, and it's a one-point game. We saw this play early in this 2A game that we did this afternoon. When you're playing against a defense that's pursuing as well as uh, Oswego is, throw the screen, and Geneseo does just that. Ryan Shedden. Picks up some nice blocks from a couple of his wideouts and one of his linemen who you see celebrating right there. Seth Graham looked like he had a good block on there. Here is the point after by Sparrow Larris. It is blocked. It is blocked by Kurt Henriksen. And so Oswego still holds on to a one-point lead with eight minutes to go in the third quarter. It is seven to six. Seven to six, Oswego has hung on to the lead, blocking the extra point. Lots of football left, eight minutes to go in the third quarter. As Spiro Liris is in to kick it off for Oswego, uh, for Geneseo. Uh, back deep, our Ricky Natividad, along with Dane Shaw. And once again, Geneseo elects to lay the football down on the tee. I think they want to keep the ball away from Ricky Natividad. They don't want him returning. Maybe get a lucky bounce, too. Gathered in again by an up man. Once again, Wilson, for the second time, comes up with a football. And once again, Oswego will get good field position at the 40-yard line. The drive for Geneseo after recovering the fumble. They went 30 yards in seven plays, taking two minutes and 30 seconds. And take a look at how they scored once again. That's right. Josh Pierce shows a lot of composure right here. Let the defensive line come to you. And he found Ryan Shedden wide open with some real nice blocks as Phil Smith, number 64, escorts him into the end zone. From the 40 for Oswego, it's first and 10. Salagi gives to Bailey a little seam, and he's able to get it up to the 43-yard line, bringing up second and seven, Jason Van Acker. Their second leading tackler on the season who will be a Division I prospect next year, in the opinion of Coach Denny Derricks, makes the stop. Van Acker with great unique instinct for the ball. Even when he makes a wrong play technique-wise, he's able to find a way of getting back and, and making a play. From the 43, it's second down. Backs it and I. Quick slant in pattern looking for Plaskus and the penalty markers fly. He was bumped before the ball got to him and that'll be pass interference. And Derek Wright can't believe that he made the play. The 
pick it up, but it'll be a first down, automatic first down. We won't have a replay of right there on that play, but Derek Wright, that was definitely pass interference. You cannot go through the receiver, and the official caught that one. And Oswego will pick up another first down. Automatic first down. Well, they get 15 yards, too, even though the play wasn't good for 15 yards, and he caught it. But it'll be all the way down to the 41-yard line, an automatic first down at the Geneseo 41, 7.02 to go, third quarter. Chad Bailey, check that. That is Dane Shaw straight ahead. A hit hard at the line by Seth Graham, the defensive tackle, as he is able to get a yard only to the 40-yard line. It's also a big hit right there by number 66, Drew Nash as well. That was really a big hit. Nash, a two-year starter, 6'1", 180 pounds, a senior. Amazing story about usually Geneseo, they have about 18 to 20 seniors show up. This year they had only 10 come out for football. They thought they were a year away. This junior class is really talented for both these teams. Second and nine. Toss goes back to Shaw. And he is close to a first down. The ball comes free. And Oswego keeps it at the 30-yard line and got a couple of yards on the fumble. Boy. Ball popping free, Andy Allen, number 68, a two-year starter at 6'3", 255 pounds, keeps the ball in Oswego's possession. Really a heads-up play by Andy Allen, 68, downfield. Once again, Dane Shaw finds a seam in that Geneseo defense, just running through people right there, but you see the ball on the ground, and into your picture comes Andy Allen and falls on that football. Seth Graham stripped the ball free. It's at the 30, first and 10 for Oswego. Wolf bumped at the line, but bounces off blockers and tacklers and gets down to the 25-yard line. Ryan Shedden makes the stop. It'll be second down and five coming up. 5.45 remaining in the third quarter. It is a 7-6 Oswego lead here in the 4A state championship game at Hancock Stadium, looming to normal. Quarterback Tim Salagi. Quarterfinals against Wakana was 7 of 12 passing for 151 yards. Wolf pops through to the 10, down to the 9-yard line. Finally stopped by Derek Wright, the quarterback who saved the touchdown. We'll get a great shot of this coming right at you from the end zone camera. Scott Wolf comes into your picture. Picks up a very nice run for Oswego, but unfortunately, we have another penalty, and that one's coming back. A 16-yard gain by Wolf, negated by an apparent holding call against Oswego as they continue to make mental mistakes and pick up costly penalties. Exactly what Carl Hoyk has talked about at halftime. They had holding to eliminate the, the... Second down. He felt that they had to eliminate the penalties. They've had a crucial penalty right here on this drive. It's from the spot of the foul, so it goes back to the 32-yard line. It's second down and 12 yards to go. They had it inside the nine if they didn't hold. Spinning inside, Dane Shaw to about the 28-yard line. Derek Wright making the stop again out of the secondary for Geneseo. A pickup of about four. Dane Shaw lines up in about every position for the Oswego team. We've seen him as a tailback. We've seen him run a little bit of fullback. That time he, he lines up as a wingback, comes back in motion on a scissors play, and picks up a nice game for Oswego. Either Bailey can't continue or they're saving him for the fourth quarter. We'll have to wait and see. Third down, eight yards to go. Zalagi, sidearms one. It's juggled and almost intercepted. Pierce almost picked it off but couldn't find the handle. Little Barnum and Bailey juggling act out there at the 15-yard line, but he could not hang on. Josh Pierce here, number 14 for Geneseo in the green jersey, playing center field, and he almost picks this one off. Just can't hang on to it, but it's nice defense and forces Oswego into a fourth and long. Fourth and eight. If you're Geneseo with a running attack, this might be a different call. Fourth and eight for Oswego. They spend everybody, they got triple receivers wide to the right side. Wolf, the lone running back. Zalagi putting it up. It's broken up and nearly picked off by Randy Roth. And he had a sure interception. And if he hangs on, he might take it back 
75 yards. But it'll go over on downs, and Geneseo takes it over, helped by that holding call. Oswego runs the two receivers off and sends Ricky Natividad down there on a slant pattern, and Randy Roth has a touchdown interception go right through his hands. It'll go over at the 28-yard line with 4.18 left to go in the third quarter. It's still a one-point game, and Geneseo breathes a sigh of relief. Popping through the line up to about the 34-yard line. Looked like it was Shoemaker on the carry. Ryan Walsh on the stop. But going back to that Oswego drive, if that holding call doesn't come in, Oswego's first and goal with the nine. Exactly right. Penalties have just killed them here in the third quarter. Second and four coming up. Carl Hoinkus, you don't think he's not in this game? <laughs> Somebody sent out for the Ann Acid. 3.47 to go, third quarter. Toss goes to Van Acker. Follows his blocking and gets it up to about the 37. It'll bring up third and very short, Sean Devine. Second string left tackle, a 6-1 senior who had a 30-yard interception return for a touchdown against East St. Louis Lincoln earlier this year. Makes the stop. There you see Hancock Stadium and the clock and the score. It is third and one coming up for Geneseo. Just outside their own 37. I would expect to see Jeremiah Shoemaker get the hands in his, the ball in his hands on this play with a third and very short. Almost a double wing formation indeed. It's Shoemaker. He has the first down and then some up to the 44 yard line. He gets seven. And a fresh set of downs for the Maple Leafs of Geneseo. Ryan Walsh on the tackle for Oswego. Great line surge by the two guards, Phil Smith and Jared Sturdwagon. And also Landon Newman, great job by the offensive line there on a surge to pick up a first down for Jeremiah Shoemaker. There's Denny Derricks, 19 and two in his second year as head coach of that tradition-filled Geneseo football club. There goes Shoemaker, one man to beat, and he's taken off his feet at the 40-yard line. Saving the touchdown was the strong safety, Ryan Walsh. And that's as big of a gain as Geneseo has had from the running game this evening. And it's, it's easy to see why Jeremiah Shoemaker had 1,000 yards this year. Very high knee kick, always has that forward lean in his running style. Picks up a huge game for Geneseo. 16 yards, and they're in business now in Oswego territory at the 40, first and 10. Van Ecker. To about the 37 yard line, picking up three. Ryan Ludwig, the cornerback, who has done a good job this year playing as a junior for Oswego, makes the stop as Derrick sends in the play. Bringing it in was 45 Matt Cook. As Carl Hoinkins says, what might have been on that last drive. And even on third and one, they had a chance maybe to get the ball back in good field position before that 16 yard run by Schumann. Second down seven, Van Ecker driving. It takes three Panthers to bring him down out of bounds across the way at the 32. The first one to greet him was Dane Shaw. But Van Ecker did not go down easily. Van Ecker was the starting fullback in the first two games of the season this year. When they moved to the running back to get some more size, they also got a good lead blocker in the backfield, and that one is when everything really began to come together for Geneseo's offense. He really runs that student body sweep very well. They pulled both their guards, Geneseo did, and this will be a big play for them, third and about two and a half. From the 33 in Oswego territory, Shoemaker, no. Barely back to the line of scrimmage. Dustin Loberg in there along with Ryan Ludwig. It'll set up fourth down. But I think just about any time Geneseo's on the other side of the 50, you might consider it four down territory, especially in these circumstances. Exactly right. They really have a lot of confidence in their defense. They're going to go for this once again. They actually lost about a yard, a yard and a half on that play. Fourth and four. Strung out, drop back at the 35 for a loss of a yard, and Oswego gets the ball back. Ryan Walsh makes the stop. 
Boy, what a game he has had out of the secondary. Unbelievable is a strong safety. How many plays he makes from sideline to sideline. Once again, he strings this one out. You see him coming right into your picture, 42 there at the top. And stop Josh Pierce short of the first down. That ball will be turned over on possession on downs. Under a minute to go in the third quarter. Oswego leading at 7-6 to six here in the 4A championship game. Now Bailey's back in there. He's in there at tailback and Wolf is in there at fullback. They move the Tibby Dodd. They were running out of time. Only three seconds on the play clock and alertly Tim Savagi calls for a timeout with just 33 seconds remaining in the third quarter. So Carl Huykus comes out to talk it over with his Panthers who have held on to a one point lead. The difference in this game a block point after. With Oswego's Kurt Hendrickson blocking the point after after Geneseo's lone touchdown of the game came here in this third quarter. For a team that's scored 39 points a game it has been this defense maybe at times unheralded defense for Oswego who has shut out five opponents this year that has kept the Panthers in the lead. Let's go down to the sidelines and uh, let's go visit with our colleague Joe Passion. After that last play a few moments ago when Geneseo turned the ball over Ryan Walsh great defensive play on that near sideline. One mistake he may have made before he left the sideline pointing at Geneseo trash talking rather than Geneseo being dejected they are now more fired up back to the field. First and ten from the thirty six. Wolf. To the fifty yard line picks up fourteen Josh Pierce makes the tackle. Josh Wolf has had a lot of success on that play. It's just a simple dive up the middle of Geneseo's defense, but he picked up another 12 yards right there, and he is a very hard runner. Goes about 5'10", 180. Excellent player. Will that defensive stand there by Oswego spark the offense? They play two platoons. It's not like you have a lot of guys playing both ways for Oswego. That's right. Not on this level. This is 4A. Wolf churns his way and drives for extra yardage to the 45 yard line. Jeremiah Shoemaker makes the stop, but he turned a two yard gain into a five yard gain as we reach the end of quarter number three. One quarter left in the battle for the state 4A championship. Oswego clinging to a one point lead. You see the score of the 4A title game with a quarter to go. Oswego leading by one. This is our fourth title game of the day. Harden Calhoun scoring 21 second half points unanswered to defeat North Boone in the 1A title game. Then it was Richmond Burton with a big second half explosion holding another opponent to only six points as they beat Moekla Central A&M 20 to 6. And DuCoin got a big touchdown by Robbie Eaton. A 40 yard touchdown run to put DuCoin ahead 14 to 10 and win the 3A title. Second and five from the 45 as Oswego has it on Geneseo side of the 50. Wolf, no gain at all, trying to get outside. Ryan shed knife through to make a fine stop. That's not where you want to see Scott Wolf running the football out on the outside. He's more effective on the inside, and there he was forced on the outside. And Ryan Shedden made a great play. Shedden, really a leader on this ball club both ways offensively and defensively now Geneseo has a lot more guys playing both ways and let's see if here in this fourth quarter it really shouldn't be a factor you're in the final game you don't leave anything on the field that's right you give it all you got third and six fumble and looks like Oswego picks up the loose football losing a yard in the process well, that one popped right out of the hands of Salagi. I don't think Tim Salagi even touched that football right there. It went right up between his hands. Very fortunate to fall on the football. We'll see it right here as it goes right through his hands. Lucky to get back on that football. Dane Shaw, who's had a big game on both sides of the ball, recovers the fumble. Here is Ross Draper on the punt. Got a good punt away. And it's going to be out of bounds at the 5-4 yard line. Oh, 
what a job by Draper. He nailed one in the corner, and Geneseo is pinned back inside their five. A punch of 43 yards with great English on it. That's right. More important than the 43 yards. He did angle that one towards the sideline, puts it out on about the four-yard line, really backs Geneseo up here. Through three quarters, Oswego had outgained Geneseo on the ground, 159 to 120. Oswego showing it can run the football as well as throw. Geneseo back deep, first and ten. Knifing up the middle. Looked to be Jason Van Ecker as he was able to get a couple of yards to about the six, maybe seven yard line. We're in the fourth and final quarter. 7-6 Oswego leads and right now Geneseo looking at an awful lot of artificial surface down to the goal line at the other end. They really are. I mean, you have 95 yards to go. Denny Durex did not want to be put in this situation very often. Second and eight. As Pierce gives to Shoemaker, but he can't make anything. He really couldn't get on either side of his blocker. He followed right up behind him, and he never had any momentum going, and it enabled Oswego to come in and stop him cold. That's Andy right. Allen. I really like what Oswego's doing here on defense. They're taking some chances down here. Geneseo has the ball against the wall here on their own goal line. Oswego's taking chances, bringing linebackers, doing a great job. Once again, they stuff the run. Third and seven. Boy, big third down play on both sides of the football here. If Oswego gets it back, it'll set them up in great field position. If they can stop them here on third down and seven yards to go. Toss goes to Derek Wright. He is spun down at the six yard line by Josh Wilson. And Geneseo will have to punt. You cannot talk enough about the linebackers for Oswego Brian Cooney and Josh Wilson. Josh Wilson shows right here on this play that he can run. And he just, that's, he's, folks, he's running down a running back right there and he can play football as he's really picking up the emotion for Oswego. Derek Wright, one of the fastest members on Geneseo's team, and Wilson got to him quickly. It'll be fourth down. And so Matt Cook is in his end zone. Greg Roscoe, the single safety back, waits at the Geneseo 45-yard line. And now whistles blow. Looks like Geneseo took too much time. Boy, this, this would really back him up to the end line. Anytime a back judge comes running in like that, you know it's a delay of game. As we saw, the play clock was down to 0-0, so that will back him up. Matt Cook coming in to punt. And he is really going to have to come up with the kick of his career. He will be just inside the end line. He won't have the full 15 yards. No, sir, and he has to be very conscious of not stepping out of the back of the end zone here on any kind of a bad snap. Rob Carruthers is the long snapper for Geneseo. He sees about a yard inside. And he gets it away. And all things considered, not a bad kick, but he doesn't get a good bounce. It's down at the 35-yard line by Shoemaker. It had taken an Oswego bounce. And so Oswego in outstanding field position at the Geneseo 35. That's really all you can expect out of the Geneseo punter. He's just trying to get the football off. 30-yard punt, put your defense on the field and hope that they can stop Oswego. Oswego with a chance here to really take command of this game. They lead 7-6 with 8.21 to go in the fourth quarter. Tim Salaki, who, according to Carl Hoykes, has done everything we have asked of him this year. Puts him down there at the 35. Wolf with a big hole. Still driving to the 11-yard line. A 24-yard gain. An inspired gain by Wolf. Randy Roth makes the stop for Geneseo. 
We were talking a lot about Chad Bailey and Dane Shaw in the first half, but once again, it is the Scott Wolf show here in the second half as he's dragging Randy Roth, number 23, for an extra five to six yards there. He is a powerful runner, and you saw why right there. 24 yards. Wolf again spins down to about the nine. He was hit hard by J.J. Ruprecht, who is coming to play defense. J.J. came in ready to play, didn't he? He put a heck of a stick on Scott Wolf there. This is a great stick, one of the better ones we've had tonight. That's helmet on helmet, folks, and uh, that's a nice tackle. Wolf now with 110 yards on 13 carries. As you see, J.J. Ruprecht, who made that big stick on Wolf. Timeout call by Salagi. As he didn't like what he saw from the Geneseo defense, and so they'll take a timeout. We'll take a break with 7-0-1 to go in the fourth quarter. Geneseo leading by one. Tom Stalker, Steve Mays with you. 7 1 to go in the fourth quarter. As Oswego knocking on the door from the nine yard line at second down and eight yards to go. And looked like somebody jumped early. Maybe Seth Graham came across into the neutral zone for Geneseo. Maybe a bit of change of cadence there for Salagi because he had two defenders coming across. That's exactly right. You have to wonder if that was called on the sideline. We have encroachment by the defense. That'll be half the distance. Oswego can get a first down here at about the one, uh, one yard line. Second down, three yards to go. Touchdown! Scott Wolf. It's only fitting that Scott Wolf should get this touchdown. Good hard running, five yard touchdown. That really puts Geneseo's backs up against the wall. Gives Oswego a 13 to six lead. 6.57 remaining. And here is Ross Draper to kick the point after. It is good. And Oswego now leads by eight with under seven minutes to go in the 4A state championship game. They got good field position off that punt. They held Geneseo to three downs and a punt. Got the ball at the 35-yard line. That's exactly right. That touchdown right there should be credited to the defense. They did a good job stopping them, forced the punt out of the end zone of Geneseo. Excellent field position, and Tim Salagi does a nice job directing the offense to their second score. So they go 35 yards. They're up by eight, but still a touchdown on a two-point conversion for Geneseo. We could be staring at overtime, so. Obviously a little more breathing room for the Panthers, but they are certainly not assured of anything right now. There's still lots of time left, but here is where that ground attack of Geneseo may work against them a little bit. They're going to have to take some time to move it downfield. Take a look at the scoring drive. They went 35 yards, three plays, taking a minute and 24 seconds with Wolf scoring from three yards. 14 to 6. So in the kickoff for Oswego, Ross Draper. And that is Eric Newton. Newton still on his feet, gets up to the 29-yard line. Good return for Newton. Pat Smith, number 56 there on your screen, makes the stop. A 17-yard return. But here is where a team like Geneseo reaches down inside and much like the storied college programs and maybe look for back for the tradition the ghosts of the past and maybe help them here in this one stretch that's exactly right 640 left to go in this football game geneseo has been here many times let's see if they can pull it out one more time 
Six and a half minutes to go. Rolling out is Pierce. He's got a lane. Across the 40 to the 43 yard line. Ryan Ludwig knocked him off his feet. A big game. That's just what Geneseo needs. Big plays like that. That's right. A little quarterback sweep right here. I don't think Josh Pierce has any intentions of throwing the football. He just gets out on the outside with some nice blocks from his running back and fullback. It picks up an excellent gain for Geneseo. 13 yards. And perhaps a bit of a chin strap problem there for Josh Pierce as he shows his helmet there to the referee. So far in the game, Josh averaging five yards a carry, 42 yards on eight carries. And that kind of a play to start this drive is just what Geneseo needed. That's exactly right. They established, hey, we can run the ball a little bit. Gives them some breathing room. Took it out to about the 42-yard line. Where it's first and ten. Pierce rolling out, being chased. He's able to turn it upfield. And oh, as he hit hard at the 48-yard line, Josh Wilson made him pay for the long gain. And Pierce gets up and says, would somebody please answer the phone? And there's a good shot right there. The strong safety, Ryan Walsh, number 42. We've called his name a lot tonight, Tom. And look at the lick that he puts on Josh Pierce. Bam! Right there with a lot of help from other white jerseys. Josh getting a long-distance phone call right now from somebody. <laughs> as Nate Durick now comes in, the other quarterback. He started the game for Geneseo. And quickly, Pierce gets attention on the Geneseo bench. Second and five. Shoemaker. A penalty marker thrown at the end of the play, and he is down to the 42-yard line. Dane Shaw applying the stop for the Oswego Panthers, but Geneseo feeling a little more confidence now. A little face-masking penalty here will tack on a few more yards for Geneseo. When a flag is thrown into a pile like that, you can almost always guess that that's going to be a face mask. Good look at the end of the play right there as the hand goes in and does grab the face mask. It really doesn't have to grab it. All it has to do is touch it. Well, they mark off five for inadvertent. Face mask penalty by the defense. First down. They're giving him the full 15-yard penalty to the 28-yard line. It'll be first and 10. And suddenly, Geneseo has come back to life. They're down by eight, 5-12 left to go. You got your quarterback that's brought you this way right there. Josh Pierce sitting on the sideline. But here is Durek. Just gets rid of it and throws it in complete near sidelines at the 32 yard lines and down on the sidelines is Joe Passion. All right down on the sideline you see Josh Pierce being attended to basically he's got a bloody nose. He's just trying to handle the blood and the trainer is trying to take care of that. But he's got his senses. He can count his whole hand and he hopes to get back in and he may be getting back in sooner than later because quarterback Nate Durek is now out keeping the Geneseo trainer very very busy. Tony One Perkins could get the call number 17. He would be their third string quarterback by the way. All the wow. players are going over to Josh Pierce seeing if he can come back in but he doesn't really look like he's putting on his helmet getting ready to get into this football game. Josh still with uh, the bandage to his bloody nose. Tom can you play quarterback. Uh, for Geneseo's sake they better hope they have somebody <laughs> else a lot more capable than this gimpy need old gray haired mayor up here I tell you. They're going to. Well I tell you what Durek is flat down. Let's go down to Joe. Do you have an update? Down on the field, the quarterback that you see down on the field that's that's injured right now, Nate Durek, they are attending to his left knee. Apparently he's injured his left knee severely enough for the sports medicine medics on the sidelines to come out and put it in a brace and to hold it together. So unfortunately for Nate Durek, a serious knee injury. But the applause in the background is because Josh Pierce is coming back on the field. Back upstairs, guys. You couldn't write a movie script any better than that. Pierce probably doesn't quite know still where he is. But he says, hey, five minutes left. And the one thing you don't want to see if you're Geneseo is see this momentum come to a halt right here because they really had things moving well. That's exactly right. 
And Josh Pierce going into the game, he's got cotton balls in his nose. He's stopping that blood. He's got his ankle taped up. He's really taken a beating this evening. All right, we'll take a break with five minutes to go. It's an eight-point Oswego lead here in the fourth quarter of the 4A state championship game. Tom Stocker, Steve Mays with you. Five minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They continue to tend to fallen quarterback Nate Durick. And this may not be a picture you may want to look at, but we will see exactly what happens to Nate on this play. And it looks like it's going to be a pretty severe injury to perhaps his ankle. And let's take a look. He's being chased by Pat Smith. The foot is ankle right there oh my goodness oh boy that's more than your basic inversion sprain folks that's a pretty nasty injury to Nate Durick and he is getting the best of care I can assure you down there by the sports medicine staff from Illinois State University and they have one of the better staffs in the state I'll have you know this is a great sports program that they have here at Illinois State and he will get excellent care Boy, what a story. Coming right out of the pages of everybody's All-American. You had uh, Pierce get knocked out, then Durek goes in. Durek now suffering a nasty ankle injury. And he is being put on a stretcher right in front of the Geneseo bench. And if you don't think now the adrenaline is not flowing just a little bit more in the hearts of those Maple Leafs, you got another thing coming. I think you made a great point, Tom. You know, we hate to see the injury right here, but what does this do to the momentum? I mean, we, you know, we're really concerned about Nate Durek, but, uh, you know, what does that do to this momentum? Oswego uh, has a chance to catch their breath a little bit. They were getting back on their heels. Geneseo was moving the ball. This drive started at the 30-yard line, and right off the bat was a big 13-yard uh, run off the very first play, and they moved it down. Again, they have it at the 28-yard line of Oswego with exactly five minutes ago as... They get Durek up on the stretcher. And you feel for the young man. Well, Nate's a junior, and we hope to, that he will recover from his injury and be able to come back next year and help this Geneseo ball club. Wish him well. It's a combination agony, frustration, a little bit of everything. A million thoughts running through his mind right now, but now back to action. Remember, Durek was taken off the field in a stretcher back earlier this year in the seventh game with a lacerated kidney. What a gutsy young man. He must really like to play football to come back from an injury like that and then uh, play the way he has. He's, I think he's more frustrated. He's hurting, but he is really, really, really frustrating as you saw his expression as he was carried off. This also gave Pierce a little extra time now to regain his senses. First and ten from the 28. And Pierce looking back the other way. Throws it on and I think wisely threw it over the outstretched hand of Matt Cook. That play was headed nowhere. A lot of pressure being put on by Pat Smith, who's talking a little bit of trash in the face of Josh Pierce at the end of that play. You think that's only left for the basketball court? No, sir. They like to do that on the football field. Kurt Hendrickson, number 44 defensive end for Oswego, did a great job staying home and smelling out that screen. Third down and ten. Pierce just a quick drop. Van Acker can't hang on at the 13-yard line. Brian Cooney was there. Looked like he had his body twisted just a little bit. He had to come back for the football. He comes up limping a little bit, but a heck of an effort by Van Acker. It really was. That was really the only place that Josh Pierce can throw the football. And Jason Van Acker, as you'll see, number 47, does have to turn a little bit and is unable to make the play. Fourth and ten. It may come all down to this, though there is still 449 remaining. This won't be Geneseo's last gap by any stretch. Throwing it up for the option. Pass interference in the end zone. Thrown downfield by Geneseo's Randy Roth. And he threw it into the end zone. Roth coming in there, throwing the option. A little razzle-dazzle out of Geneseo. It really is. You can almost see this one coming from up here. 
as Geneseo pulls out another trick out of their playbook. And Ryan Ludwig, number 33 for Oswego, you will see him not making a play on the football. He goes for the Geneseo player, Eric Newton. You can't do that. And that will keep the drive alive for Geneseo. But unlike uh, in the NFL, it's not at the one-yard line. It'll be a 15-yard penalty or at this. Uh, Defensive pass interference by the defense. Automatic first down. It will go to the 14-yard line. That was actually a good play right there by Oswego if you're beat. You know, you might as well run into him. Don't let him get the touchdown. They're only going to get the yardage on the penalty. Pierce to the short side of the field. Keeps it to the 10-yard line. He gets four. Boy, does this remind me of that late drive against Joliet Catholic two years ago by Geneseo. Same end of the field even. And you'll see Josh Pierce right there. Well, he can barely get up after he's tackled every time. He's got a lot of guts, blood all over his helmet. It's coming out of his nose. I mean, what an effort by Josh Pierce. Put him on the old Madden team, huh? That's right. You bet. From the 11-yard line, it is second down and about to seven to go. Shoemaker strung out nicely. First to get to him was Hendricks in the left end, and Ludwig finished up on the play. He is... Losing a yard on the play to the 12-yard line. There's Ryan Ludwig, the 5'11 junior. Third down. And a long eight. The ball back of the 12-yard line. I'll tell you what, Denny Derrick has pulled everything out of his pockets. He had a flanker reverse earlier. Now he had the halfback option here. Third and eight. Fumble by Pierce. Oswego has it. Ryan Ludwig. And he's out of bounds at the 28-yard line. Geneseo had two chances to get to it, but couldn't. And Ludwig finally scooped it up. 3.17 left to go. So it'll be at the 28-yard line, first and 10. Take a look at it, Steve. I think Josh Pierce right there is going to run a little option pass, but unfortunately it hits, hit, it hits his second back through. Number 44, Eric Newton. And the ball goes on the ground, and Oswego picks that one up for a first down. First and 10. Five turnovers now for Geneseo. And they're going to keep it on the ground, Oswego will, just to keep their clock going as it now nears the three-minute mark. Carl Hoinkus. There with Jim Worland, who now runs in the play. Also sending in Tim Salagi. Don't expect that ball to be in the air if you're Oswego. I think that ball is going to be on the ground. They will be very happy with punting this football away. They just want to take some time off this clock. Second and 11. 240 now left to go. Wolf stopped at the 28 yard line for no gain. Jason Van Acker, Rob Carruthers on the stop. Two and a half minutes to go. Timeout taken by the Maple Leafs of Geneseo. Let's go down now and get an injury update from Joe Pesci. Well, while there is an injury down on the field for Oswego, let me update you the Geneseo injury that everyone certainly has reason to be concerned about here. The quarterback, Nate Dirk, who was taken off the field, one of the paramedics who was attending him, told me that the doctor cannot say for sure that the ankle or the fibula was broken, but based on the looseness of the bones in that area, it indicates definitely a broken bone. They cannot make a final summation until after an x-ray. He's on his way to the hospital and obviously in great deal of pain. Meanwhile, as we've talked about already upstairs from the announcers, that Josh Pierce has really been a tremendous player already, showing his guts. But I think you're both right, guys. He's not quite sure still where he is. But where he's doing it from is doing it with a lot of courage. Back upstairs, guys. The Oswego player that was down was right tackle Andy Allen, one of the several players who decided to go with the uh, clean-shaven look up top. Looked like he may have a knee or maybe ankle injury as he has helped off. Senior offensive lineman Andy Allen, a two-year starter and all-state candidate, one of the strongest players on this Oswego team. 
Tim Salagi now comes in, the 6'3 senior. They've got 2.30 left. Oswego leading by eight, 14 to six. I'm not going to go over there because. Third down, 11 yards to go from the 28 yard line. Tennessee, if they can stop them here, we'll have one last chance. Salagi going for Natividad. Can't hang on at the 42 yard line. He had single coverage with the free safety, Josh Pierce. Not a bad call, but indeed now, Genesee will get the ball back. That's right, Rick Natividad did have a step on the defensive back, and Salagi put it right where he needed to, but Natividad just couldn't hang on to it, and this will fourth, force a fourth in about 10 and a half. So it'll be Ross Draper, who has averaged 38 yards per punt tonight, his longest, as you see, was 43. Eric Newton, the single safety, back at his own 43. Draper gets it away. Fair catch called for, and taken at the 46 by Newton. Boy, not bad field position. 218 left, a punt of 26 yards for Ross Draper. Good job by Eric Newton there, the wing back for Geneseo. All you want to do is catch that football. Geneseo brought 10 men trying to block the punt. Weren't able to do that, but they will have excellent field position. Geneseo, who has gone unbeaten this year, knocking off the likes of Streeter and Dixon and Sterling. In the regular season, Peoria Emanuel Rock Falls, Peoria Notre Dame, and Decatur Eisenhower in the playoffs. Penalty markers stop the play just as it gets started. And that usually indicates somebody in the neutral zone. We have a false start by the offense. Still first down. Not what Geneseo needed. It'll bring up first and 15. And again, not a lot of time left. Two minutes, 16 seconds of the fourth quarter. Well, we'll get a chance right here to see if Geneseo has a two-minute offense. Probably haven't had to use that a lot this year. They like to run out of that wing tee. He fakes to Shoemaker, the pitch to the trailing man, and they lost yardage when he pitched it back to Derek Wright. Ryan Walsh, who has been a real leader in the secondary for Oswego this whole season, came up to apply the brakes. Well, you can't talk talk enough about Ryan Walsh. He's been in on a bunch of tackles this evening, just running from sideline to sideline. Once again, he makes a nice play. They lost two on the play. It's now at the 40-yard line where it's first and 17. Oswego has held opponents to only nine points a game this year. Pierce throwing an incomplete overthrowing Eric Newton over the middle. As he was close to the Oswego 40 yard line, it stops the clock with 2.05 remaining. Josh, cover, uh, Josh Wilson was providing coverage on the play for Oswego. Second and 17. Playing right into Oswego's hands here. They got to play catch up football, Geneseo does, and they're going to have to do something they really don't like to do, and that is put the football up top. Again, they had averaged, they had only a total of 60 pass attempts this whole season. That's incredible. That is unbelievable. Third down, 17 yards to go. Newton's the man in motion. Pierce rolls out left. It's underthrown and intercepted. Intercepted at the 48-yard line by Ryan Walsh. Boy, he and Shaw have had tremendous games back in the secondary for Oswego tonight. Six turnovers now for Geneseo this evening. There's Ryan Walsh really egging on the crowd on this one. He shows how athletic he is. He goes up way up high to get the interception. With about a minute 52, that might have been Geneseo's last breath. Oswego has a, more, a minute and 46 remaining. Four of those six turnovers, by the way, have been by interceptions by Oswego. Picking his way through the right side, Scott Wolf. And he gets good yardage to the 46 yard line. He gets a couple. Jason Van Acker, Randy Roth combined to make the stop. But right now, Geneseo needs a takeaway badly, and the clock continues to run. It's under a minute 20. Geneseo might have to start thinking about here with a minute 13 now about timeouts. They're going to have to start using them. We're going to see Oswego with the ball on the ground. They have two remaining. 
Second down. About five yards to go. Wolf gets a couple of more to about the 44-yard line. And Genesee is going to have to burn a timeout with 52 seconds remaining. They will have one timeout left. There you see both teams with a timeout, but Oswego won't use it unless positively have to. <laughs> and I doubt that is the first thing on their mind right now. 52 seconds remaining. And I think when you really boil all this down, while the Oswego offense came in here with a lot of the headlines, it was the defense that is carrying them to what apparently will be their first ever state championship in their first trip to the finals. And looks like Oswego will come away second for the second consecutive time. 52 seconds left. Got to be one of the better defenses we've ever seen. Uh, you know, red, led by Brian Cooney, Josh Wilson, Ryan Walsh, really have had a big game and uh, shut down on a very powerful Geneseo offense. Of course, Geneseo had that opportunity. They had it there inside the 10, but Pierce lost the handle on the snap, and Oswego recovered. Just too many turnovers committed by Geneseo tonight. Now on the year, Oswego coming into this game plus 16 on takeaway giveaways. That will say something about their defense. Over the top goes Wolf and drive for the first down to the 39 yard line and that should do it 47 seconds remaining as they'll get a fresh set of downs Seth Graham makes the stop for Geneseo has Scott Wolf had a second half or what I mean he has been unbelievable well Chad Bailey may not have been at full strength in the second half Scott Wolf says okay I've also gained a thousand yards this year too give me the football over. yeah Last timeout burned off by Geneseo with 47 seconds remaining. An opportunistic Oswego offense. This was a one point game, four minutes into the second half. Geneseo has not led in tonight's ball game. And they had that one chance down by eight. Down deep in Oswego territory, but turned it over one of their six for the evening. With Geneseo not having any timeouts left, I wouldn't expect that Oswego is going to even hand the football off. I would expect Tim Salagi to go down on one knee. In fact, I already saw Salagi saying, guys, I'm going down to one knee. He kind of motioned, going down to one knee, and really all they need to do. He's even one letting the two. official know. Yeah, <laughs> one, maybe two, please. Everybody's in tight. Zalagi gets it, goes down to one knee. 44 seconds, so they will have to snap it again. It'll be second down. Carl Hoink is directing this to the very last second, but the celebration beginning across the way here at Hancock Stadium, and Denny Dirks. A tough, tough defeat, losing for the first time this year here in the state championship game. 15 seconds left, one last time for Salagi to go down to one knee. He goes down to one knee and that'll do it. Oswego will win the 4A state championship. They'll finish 13 and one. Geneseo finishes with the same record. But Oswego brings the state championship back to the Little Seven Conference. On their first trip to Bloomington Normal, they win it all. Just an unbelievable effort by Oswego as all the fans are celebrating. The cheerleaders are even coming out and getting into the action. Really great to see. We'll be back for the presentation of the state championship trophy after we take this time out as Oswego has won the 4A state championship right here on Sports Channel.
And welcome back as the Panthers celebrate winning the state 4A football championship on their first trip down here to Hancock Stadium as Carl Hoinkes. Congratulated by teammates and fans and the whole town of Oswego has gone crazy over there on Route 34 at Geneseo. Second straight time they've come here and come back with second place as Geneseo picks up its third second place finish in their seventh trip to the state finals, their first trip all the way back in 1976. Disappointed but proud, the Maple Leafs go up to accept the second place trophy. To show you how the defense has dominated this game, Geneseo held to its lowest point total of the season, six points, and in winning, Oswego scores its second lowest point total, its lowest winning total, 14 points. They were held to 12 in their loss to Morris. But Geneseo, what a tradition-laden program. And this is a junior-dominated team. Oh. That, that's right, and a lot of those players are going to get a chance to come back again next year. They will remember the feeling it is to finish second in state. They will have a lot of emotion going into next season saying, we would like to come home with the state championship trophy. Another impressive trophy will be added among many there at Geneseo High School. Don't be surprised as they choke back tears. Their hearts right now, right up just below their Adam's apple, that don't be surprised that the Maple Leafs are back next year. So they accept the second place trophy and clear the stage as the champions will now be crowned as here come the Panthers of Oswego. And they take the stage. Carl Hoikus, his first team went 0-9 in 1981. He didn't have a winner until 1985, his fifth season, when they were 5-4. Now the last two years, they are 24-2. A lot of hard work by his players, a lot of hard work by the assistant coaches, the trainers, everybody involved. What a feeling this has got to be for Carl Hoinkes. Very happy for him. As he's hugged about everybody in his stadium, I think. Oswego. Finishing the season in the rankings, ranked fifth behind Carbondale and Morris and Bishop Mack out of Kankakee and New Lenox Providence, the defending champs. Don Robinson handing out the medals. Oswego winning 14 to 6. And indeed, we had the second half that we thought we would. Very defensive oriented, though. You look back and Turnovers killing Geneseo. Most of them through the air. Now again, they had passed the ball only 60 times all season. And that proved to be their Achilles heel in tonight's state title game. That's exactly right. When you're not used to throwing the football and you're forced to do that, that's exactly what Oswego wanted them to do. They did force them into a lot of turnovers. And there it is. They salute their fans across the way. They won't need a team bus. I think they'll all fly back on cloud nine. Back with more of our post-game festivities in the 4A championship game after we take this time out right here on Sports Channel. Oswego wins the 4A title and with a pleasant chore down there in the sidelines talking with the victorious coach is Joe Passion. All right, thanks very much, Tom. And we have a very victorious coach here, Carl. Uh, you know, they look at the signs across the way on the hats. They all say big O, but it was the big D in the second half that really came through. It really was. You know, uh, I thought our defense played an outstanding ball game, the whole ball game. And we had a, they had the ball inside the 25 there a couple of times inside the 20. And our defense rose to the occasion, uh, made some good plays. Uh, the kids just, what can I say? You know, they're, they, they've come together as a group, and we, we're, we're, we hit pretty good. 
and we did our jobs. Well, between Walsh and Shaw and the defensive backfield and all the picks that they got back there, but the great pressure your defensive front line put on their quarterbacks, both of them. Yeah, they, they um, you know, they're not a real throwing ball club, and we knew if we could get in, get them into that phase, our rush would probably get to them, and our coverage was was good. So, you know, this is a great moment for Oswego, and I'm really happy for the kids and. Uh, you know, we're state champs right now, and it's something that probably won't sink in for a while, but, you know, we're happy to be there. The first state championship ever for Oswego. You came very close to getting down here last year, came up a bit short, and then came here and took it all. Yeah, last year we lost to Providence, who has ended up being the state champions, and, uh, you know, we took one step beyond that this year, and uh, we hope to come back here. This is, uh, you know, this is everyone's goal, but right now we're going to enjoy this one, I'll tell you. What plans do you have right now? This is a ball club that lost only one game this year to, at the time, highly touted state-ranked Morris. They did not get down here. You guys did. That conference gets tougher and tougher no matter what they call it. Well, you know, it's called the Little Seven, but like I, we always said, uh, we've always done a good job representing our conference in the state tournament, and uh, we got the big one this year, and uh, we'd like to try to come back someday, but, you know, we'll think of We'll take it one year at a time. One last thing, you got to tell us the haircut story because I know there's going to be barbers who are going to be looking for more work now that the football season's over. <laughs> right. Well, I told the kids uh, before the Bishop Mac game that if uh, we get us, they, they get me down on the AstroTurf, they can have my hair. And sure enough, as soon as we got off the bus from Bishop Mac, they took my hair. All right. Enjoy spreading around the floor. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, Carl. Have a great celebration back in Oswego. You can imagine that town is going to be going crazy with a lot of hair on people's floors. Nonetheless, the floor here at Hancock Stadium now rather crusty with some ice. Hopefully it will thaw up. They're expecting sunny and rather moderate temperatures for tomorrow's Class 5A and 6A game in the afternoon, and maybe we'll actually see the sun. In the meantime, we saw four great football games here today, and we look forward to having you out here tomorrow. In the meantime, I'll send it back upstairs to the guys who will also be with us for one of the games tomorrow. Tom and Steve. I tell you what, if the sun does come out, make sure we get it on tape, guys, and show it as an instant replay. I won't <laughs> believe it. But uh, a hair-raising night for Oswego. They win the 4A state championship with a thrilling 14-6 victory over the Geneseo Maple Leafs. Two fine programs. It came down to defense, and uh, Geneseo forced to do what it doesn't like to do, and Oswego getting exactly what it wanted. It got the lead and forced Oswego to play catch-up and force them to do things they just aren't comfortable doing, and the defense and did it. That's right, exactly. It, I mean, this game couldn't have gone by the game plan much better for Oswego. They got up on them early, forced Geneseo to throw the football, something they don't like to do. They did it 60 times all year. And, uh, you know, hey, let's face it, that was the uh, that was a big factor in this football game. That's off to the Oswego Panthers. Tim Salagi, the quarterback, Bailey and, and Wolf, the big running back heroes, the heroes out of the secondary like Ryan Walsh and Dave Shaw and, and so many others, too numerous to mention. A, a victory they will savor a long time at Oswego High School. They win their first ever state football championship. We will do it all again tomorrow. Two more championships will be decided tomorrow at 12 noon. It'll be Wheaton Warrenville South against Joliet Catholic for the 5A title. That'll be live on Sports Channel Plus. And then at 2.30, it'll be the 6A battle from the Catholic lead, Loyola Academy against Naperville North out of the DuPage Valley Conference. Your producer director for IHSA football has been Timothy J. Sutton. Our executive producer, Greg Bowman. The remote facilities provided by Trio Video of Chicago. Final score for the 4A championship. Oswego wins at 14-6. For Steve Mays, I'm Tom Stocker. Good night, everybody. The preceding has been an exclusive presentation of Sports Channel.